All righty then. <laughs> it is Friday afternoon. We're a little off of our normal schedule because guess what? I don't have a schedule today uh, because I'm home and it's Black Friday and it's the day after Thanksgiving. Well, and, we're actually uh, back to our original schedule, Vince. That is true. Our our original, original schedule your before they pre, had to change things your up Your pre-teaching on me. schedule. Yes. Well, it was my, my last year's teaching schedule mm-hmm. because we had... way better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll let, I'll let uh, the... Southland Community School Corporation. And you need to no. hurry up and like get the credibility in your school to be able to pick whenever you're able to do this. Yeah, so. anyway, I got a long way to go for that one. Okay. Uh, but the good news is it is a Friday free-for-all mailbag. And it's the, well, it's not the last Friday free-for-all mailbag, but it's the last Friday free-for-all mailbag prior to the last game of the regular season. And uh, I can't believe that it's already here. I can't believe the season has gone by as fast as it has. Uh, Mm -hmm. But we have a lot to talk about today, and there's already some really amazing questions in the queue, uh, questions that I probably can't even answer. So that's it's a good thing that my guy, Brian Driscoll, is here. He's the publisher at (laughs) IrishBreakdown.com, and uh, I'm the football analyst at IrishBreakdown.com, and I'm the guy with the terrible memory. So a lot of these questions are going to come, like, you have to go back in the annals of history, of Notre Dame football history, to come up with some answers. So. Who do you all think I am? Lou Samochi, the great one? I mean, you kidding you're, me? You're, you're Irish Breakdowns version, okay? <laughs> so that's what we're going to run with today. That's that's for sure. So how, right. how was your Thanksgiving, first of all? I got to ask. Well, we just relaxed. We haven't actually had Thanksgiving dinner yet. So oh. Angela was kind of not feeling good Wednesday night. And so I said, hey, let's see how you're feeling in the morning. And then she still wasn't feeling good yesterday. And so we just kind of relaxed. I made her... Uh, her favorite. I made her uh, fettuccine chicken Alfredo oh. last night for dinner. So uh, with the homemade Alfredo sauce. So I made that for her last night. She was feeling a lot better today. And so we actually just got our bird in the oven around 1230. So <laughs> very excited gotcha. about that. Yeah, very, very nice about that. I ate way too much turkey yesterday um, because I felt really good about how ours came out. And so I just piled it on the plate and just kept going. And uh And unfortunately, when you have kids, they tend to pile some of their stuff onto your plate as well. And uh, who am I to not have a clean plate? So, But uh, it was a good Thanksgiving in the D'Addario household, had all the family over. You know, people were falling asleep all over the place by the time the day was over. So you know that it had to be good. Uh, So with that said, I hope everybody out there in Irish Breakdown land had a wonderful Thanksgiving if you were able to celebrate yesterday. If you're going to celebrate today like Brian, good luck. And uh, let's jump into the questions, Brian. Despite Bless you. Sneeze like the entire time I was talking. Okay, here we go. Uh, Q Kibbs is jumping right in, and he Q Kibbs had a comment at eleven fifty six. So uh, this one's been sitting in here for a minute. Uh, it says, "What is your favorite Notre Dame quote? You got mossed moment. I am going Chris Brown against Boston College in twenty fifteen." That was certainly the most recent. I, I think Golden Tate had about 37 of those in 2009. <laughs> uh, one of them was the Washington State Hail Mary at the end of the first half. That was a pretty sick, pretty sick catch. Michael Floyd had one, and I'm trying to remember which year it was, but he had one on the sideline against Michigan State that was just filthy. I feel like Michael Floyd and and Golden Tate had a lot of them. Javon McKinley had a couple last year that I thought were pretty good. Chase Claypool had a couple really good ones in 2006 or 2018. So not even the year he he was really, really good. And one of the most important ones was Tyler Eifert's in 2012 against Stanford. The one where he just went up on two dudes and just outplayed him for the ball. Yeah, uh, that was a huge that one. one. Huge I remember one, that one. That game. I was on the field for that one. By oh, nice. Very nice. By the time Very it nice. happened, you know what I mean? Like it was – because, you know, the whole five minutes at the end of the game, the media can go down. Now they've got all kinds of restrictions on the media where they can go and stuff. I don't even go down. It's a waste of time. Yeah. Uh, but that, but back then, I went down every game, and that was obviously at the end, and it was beautiful. It was mm-hmm. beautiful. He climbed the ladder for that thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of – Chris Brown's against BC was pretty big, too. That was a heck of a play, and it was unexpected. Like, that's not what you know Chris Brown for, right? Like – Chris Brown's like the fast guy and he's kind of skinny and you don't think of Chris Brown mossing people in the end zone. So that certainly would be one. And Michael Mayer's against Virginia a couple weeks ago wasn't too bad either. (laughs) The one where he caught it off the guy's back, that's not technically mossed, but it was pretty impressive nonetheless. Somebody in here, and and I'm I'm looking for it, 
um, had uh, the Chris Fink catch against Michigan. Ooh, like, that was a real good one. That yeah, might be that mine was a right real there. good one. Because you want to talk about unexpected. Over two uh, guys. I think yeah. that one was pretty unexpected. Yeah, that was a really good one. Really that, that, good one. That's that one sticks out in my mind as well. So that that's the the route that I will take on this one. And uh before we continue, Mike Nolan has jumped in with a super chat. Mike, thank you very, very much. Appreciate that. Wholeheartedly. Um okay. No, here we go. This is where I'm probably going to have to defer to you, Brian. Caleb Collins says, build an all-time Brian Kelly staff. At yeah, this is a good one. This, this is, is a really good really one. really good one. Yeah. You, you were writing it down, aren't you? And that's what you're doing I'm right working now. on writing it down, yeah. So, <laughs> I knew it. Um, let's go to the – there's a super chat. Let's go to that. And by the time that one's – we're done with oh, that I, one, I'll have my – I already did, brother. You were already oh, thinking. Man. I you was were already, already writing stuff down. You were already Come on, Mike. You needed a question. Does Mike have a question that comes after that? Uh, there's nothing after that at the present. Man. Okay. Um. So so let's work through this together, right? So <laughs> okay. I'm going with six offensive positions. I'm going with four defensive positions just because that's what Kelly's always kind of done. Okay. And uh, – or no, I'm going – yeah. And then I'm going uh, – no, I'm actually going to go five and five. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mix things up a little bit, okay? Are you going to have a special teams coordinator? No. Okay. Not one who just coaches special okay. teams, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah. So what I'm gonna so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna yeah. Let me see here. I'm gonna see how to make mix this one up. All right. Okay. Okay. So this is gonna be is, interesting. What is, your, what is your fifth defensive coach? Yeah. Like, yeah. This is gonna be the interesting one. Okay. So I'm gonna yeah. mess things. I'm gonna mix things up a little bit. All right. My offensive coordinator is Mike Dembrock, who would then also be the receivers coach. Okay. And my offensive GA would be Ryan Mahaffey. Who wow, you're going GA too? Well, you have to because you know you got these coaches right. And Ryan Mahaffey, I thought, did a great job at Notre Dame as the GA. And you're not really bringing back helped. Chris Watt, huh? You're not can you back let Chris can Watt. you let me finish my? <laughs> no, you have Harry Heastan. You don't need Chris Watt okay. right, to be right. your to be your assistant, right? Poking holes, man. But uh, well. Do a good job of it. Don't just wow. poke bad holes. I mean, you've got Eric Heastan. You don't need Chris. So, it's a mic so drop moment. Very my good. my quarterbacks coach, with all due respect to uh, to Tommy Reese, is, is Matt Lafleur. If he actually cared about staying in college, hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, if it's not that, then I'd go with Tommy Reese because I do think Tommy Reese has done a nice job coaching sure. quarterbacks. He's done. He certainly did better than the guys before him. Agreed. He's way better than Mike Sanford. Way better than Charlie Molnar. Uh, and better than Chuck Martin, in my opinion, just as a pure quarterbacks coach. Sure. No, absolutely. But, you know, I mean, one guy's the head coach of the Green Bay Packers. And even though he didn't do a great job at Notre Dame, if like if I could have him as part of my ultimate staff, it means he wants to be here more than sure. a year. Yeah. And my running backs coach, all due respect to Lance Taylor, it's Tony Alford. That's my man. I mean, okay. So because you also yeah. have to take into account recruiting, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that has to be part of this. Mm -hmm. And there's not many recruiters in the country better than Tony Alford. I mean, just plain and simple. So, yeah. and not only that, he's a good, he was a good running backs coach, right? But he's an, he's an amazing recruiter. Mm -hmm. My tight ends coach would be Chip Long. Okay. That's it. He's, he's yep. always teaching. That's all he's mm -hmm. coaching, huh? Okay. Mm -hmm. My okay. offensive line coach is obvious. It's Harry Heastan. And if Harry Heastan decided to retire, it'd be Ed Warner. <clears throat> My defensive staff. This is going to be. This is going to create some 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 uh, controversy in some your mind. Controversy because I'm okay. not going to do defensively what I did on offense. Okay, which is have you know Mike Elko coaching safeties and not be the coordinator. Right, I'm not going to do that. I'm only cheating on that. And if and if I couldn't have Chip Long at tight ends, if I had to stick with just assistants that coach that position, then I'd go with John McNulty. I just you know he, Scott, he brings a lot to the table. Yeah, I mean, he, just, he was he's a better coach than Scott Booker was. And, right, right. Yeah. So then I would go with my defensive coordinator would be Marcus Freeman. And I know that's going to be controversial to some, but I think the results the second half of the season have kind of shown why that's important. But the reality is the gap between Marcus Freeman and Clark Lee as recruiters is, is greater than yeah. any perceived gap in regards to them as coordinators. And I'd rather have the guy who's a really good coordinator and a great recruiter than a guy who's a great coordinator and a okay recruiter yeah no that Which makes a lot of sense because was. really good athletes can make up for some things because what game. what's the expression always been and it's true on defense it's more about the jimmies and the joes right right and no and marcus question. freeman is a good coach he's a i think he's a very good defensive coach and he's also a 
so far proven to be a great recruiter at Notre Dame. And you, he had a big role in the talent that Cincinnati has on defense there. And the defense is what's driven their undefeated season in large part. So I'd have Marcus Freeman as my, as my um, defensive coordinator. He would not have a position to coach by himself. I figured okay? that would be the case. The defensive line. I mean, it's Mike Elston. Is this like even really need to be a conversation? And I actually liked what Keith Gilmore did. I mean, Keith Gilmore was the a, a, a primary recruiter of the, the Dalen Hayes, Khalid Kareem, Adi Ogundishi class. He's the one that saw Adi. But Mike Elston's just so far superior in just about every way, especially what he's done the last four or five years has been really, really impressive as a coach and a recruiter. Sure. And he's just a great ambassador of the program, mm -hmm. in my opinion. I think that factors in as well. My cornerbacks coach is going to be uh, Mike Mickens. And my safeties coach is going to be Chuck Martin. And if Co Chuck Martin doesn't want to not be a head coach anymore, which is I understand, then I would have Kerry Cooks be my safeties coach. So that would be, or, or I know it's torn there. It's Kerry Cooks, is uh, Coach Elliott, but you know, I mean, he's passed away, and I just felt that'd be kind of weird, you know, with just kind of talking about him. And then I'm going to cheat a little bit on my linebackers coach. That's where you're putting your GA. No, oh. because I still have, I still have, I still have room for one more coach. Okay. Right. And it's going to be Nick Lazinski. It's going to be my linebackers coach. Interesting. Even though he's never been a linebackers coach. He's on the staff as a GA. That's right. right. Now, yeah. here's what I would do. I would have Nick Lazinski and, and either, either Chuck Martin or Mike or, or Mike Mickens would be, they'd be co-special teams coordinators that on, on my on my squad. That's, that's who my special teams coordinators would be. Okay. So I think that'd be a great group of teachers. I think that'd be a great group of coaches and a great group of recruiters. That, yeah. And, that, and could that you imagine Chip, could you imagine Harry Heastan, Chip Long, Mike Dembrock, Tony Alford on the same staff recruiting? They were all great recruiters at Notre Dame. I mean, great recruiters at Notre Dame, in my opinion. And then you got Mike for Marcus. I mean, you basically have the new, the current staff, Plus Chuck Martin, yeah, who's been a successful. And that's head coach. no offense to Chris O'Leary. I think Chris O'Leary's got a bright future, coach and safeties. But I mean, Chuck Martin. But if you put the resumes a, next to right, each other, right I now mean, in five yeah. years we may be having a different conversation. Right. But right now, and this isn't a knock on Chris O'Leary. It's my not having Chris O'Leary is not the same as not having Jeff Quinn or Dell Alexander, who I just don't think are right. doing a good job. This guy's been a, Coach O'Leary's been a, a Division One position coach for not even a full season yet. Right, exactly. So, uh, and and Chuck Martin, I thought did a great job in Notre. I mean, Chuck Martin went from safeties coach to offensive coordinator. Right, <laughs> that's I mean, true. You're a good coach when and and that <clears throat> team where he was the offensive coordinator went undefeated and played for the national championship. So uh, he he obviously did a pretty good job. But yeah, Mike Dembrock would definitely be my offensive coordinator though. Good stuff. Pablo Cruz is jumping in. We got the, these are some big overarching type questions today. But Pablo says, I'm ignorant with the X's and O's of football, but just have a question for you guys. What type of offensive system or scheme would be the most beneficial on the type of players that we have? Well, I think they're finally running it for the most yeah, part. I agree and, with and, that. and this is something that we we talked a lot about. And I think Connor Patton addresses this a little bit in a follow-up to Pablo's question. But you know, Pablo, it, it varies from team to team. I think what worked, what what I think they should be doing for this year's team is not necessarily what I would have done with last year's team. Now, sure. I don't think they did everything that they should have done with last year's team, partly because I think they stubbornly relied on the offensive line too much and, and right. just allowed them to just kind of dominate and not scheme their way to success as well. But at the same time, they also had, I mean, last year they had legit injuries to me. To Like you had Braden Lindsay was hurt from from jump. Kevin Austin was hurt from jump. I mean, they, they started they the season hurt. And they planned a lot of the things that they were going to do offensively on having those guys. Right. I mean, those guys aren't there. That does make a difference. Now, I don't think that they adapted very well. Correct. To not having them. Which is a somewhat under, like, as I've kind of come back from the year and looked back on last season, I was probably too hard on their inability to make those adjustments, number one, because of the roster that they had. But number two, it was such a weird COVID year, and we've learned more and more and more about what they could and couldn't do, you know, who they could and couldn't have in a room, who, you sure. know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and it, 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 as I think about it as a coach, boy, it had been a lot harder to kind of get some of those guys ready to go uh, based on what they were going through last year, you know. So, like, I was very hard on not getting the freshman receivers ready, and I still think they should have played just, but 
as you learn more about kind of what's going on with the COVID stuff, which was so new to us, right? I mean, it was just Absolutely. like, it just everything was so new. Oh, for so sure. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm not as mad about it now as I was then. And I probably should have been more, you know what? Let me think through this. Let me make some phone calls. Let me find out what's going on before, you know, and, and I had some good sourcing, but like, you know, just a little bit more to find out. Like, is is this just a normal thing or is there a reason yeah. for this? Well, once yeah. you have some of those conversations after the season and people finally open up and it was they weren't opening up in an excuse making standpoint. It was really just like, OK, here's 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 how things went. Season's over now. And here's kind of what went like. Yeah, it's not an excuse. It's just information. Right. I mean, that right. A lot of people don't feel comfortable divulging during right. the season, and that's totally understandable. And they're still all adjusting. I mean, they're having to right. absorb it all because so much Absolutely. of it. I mean, you know, hey, we're two and oh. Oh, by the way, we have to cancel the next two weeks. We can't play right. because of COVID outbreak. Right. Which means you can't be in meetings. You know, it just it it was it was a mess. Right. So, but but to your point, Pablo, I, I felt like when you've looked <clears> at Notre Dame's best teams under Brian Kelly, I mean, the really the best offenses, I should say, under Brian Kelly. It's been when they've had athletic, speedy receivers, and they attack the perimeter with the pass game, and and take shots down the field. I mean, you think yeah. twenty fourteen, you know, perimeter scrimming. Will Fuller had a lot of really impressive RPO screens, more so in twenty fourteen than twenty fifteen. You know, you were hitting CJ Wait, CJ Procise out of the backfield. You know, you were running outside zone stretch stuff where you were using your speed and your great line to be effective. And I think that system is is the closest thing we're seeing to what they're doing now. It's different, but, you know, I mean, RPOs have to be a part of it, in my opinion, but RPOs are not a play call. I remind everybody that they're not a play. Of, you know, you don't, hey, call an RPO. An RPO is a philosophy. It's more so than anything else because the play you're calling is, you're calling two plays. You're calling the run play and you're calling the pass concept. It's not, they don't have to be married. The pass, you can do whatever pass concept you want that fits along with the run. They don't they're, they don't go together. So you're not actually you're running plays you normally run, but you're just running them kind of two at a time. Right. That to me would be should be part of it. But I feel like an inside outside zone team with a, with the misdirection stuff. You know, buck sweep and counter uh, are things. Buck sweep's not a misdirection, but just a couple additional pin and pulls I think are things that they could do. So I and, and even at the beginning of the year, it wasn't so much that they weren't doing things that they should do it's they weren't emphasizing enough the things they need to do so like even early in the season we saw Tommy Reese do some post snap switching he ran ran some levels concepts you know did some things like that it was just more of a we're not seeing enough of that and as we've gotten later the season we're seeing more and more and more of that we're seeing yeah. more tempo but I don't ever think Notre Dame needs to be a a Oregon 2010 offense they don't need to be that there's there's no reason your your line's too good for you to be that in my opinion and and I, I don't think that's necessarily conducive to having a great defense. You know, if if you had a pro style system, which is what I think Notre Dame is, but being able to utilize college things that you can get away with in college, and maybe you can't in the pros, you can do more with the RPO game in in college is f- because they just don't have the athletes on defense that they have in the NFL. There's things you can do where, where you know, some teams that run the air raid stuff, they don't even block. I mean, they don't even block the front. They don't even pass pro. and you Expose your quarterback to bigger hits. Well, you can do that in college. Do that in the NFL. Your quarterback's going to get crushed. I mean, so there's always types of things you can do that I think Notre Dame needs to do a better job of, you know, pushing the tempo a little bit more, being willing to go really, really fast, but only using it as a mix-up every now and then, not as your, your base. But you are going with some tempo you know, spreading the field formationally, but also being diverse enough to where you can go to tight ends and still be diverse with how you do things and building around your, your, you know, using like, I'm a big believer that you build around the run in theory, but also being flexible enough. Like they finally got to this season where, you know, Hey, our run game isn't as good as it's been in the past. Our line's not as good as it needs to be. So we're going to do more of more things with, you know, building around the past. Your philosophy changes a little bit, but your concepts don't change. You don't you don't need to change your playbook. Like when Vince and I were getting mad about stuff they were doing earlier in the year, we were never like, hey, they need to run this play that Oklahoma's running. They need right. to run this play that Ohio State's running. No, that's that's what like people don't know football do. You don't just you don't add a bunch of new stuff in the middle of the year. You always add wrinkles to what you do, but you don't necessarily just like change your playbook in the middle of the year. That's right. not what the offense did. They started emphasizing different aspects of the offense they had already installed. And that's the key. So I don't know if that answered your question, Pablo, but I don't think that Notre Dame's offense is necessarily that far away. 
There are some concepts I'd like to see Notre Dame utilize more that they don't really use at all, but that's more of an off-season thing. I think the stuff they have in their in their package now is correct. They just need to start emphasizing more of the of the levels concepts, more of the stuff where you're using your speed to outrun people because you don't have Chase Claypool and Miles Boykin anymore or Michael Floyd. So you can't just be playing horizontal stretch, one-on-one, big boy football, right? You've got guys that can run. Use them. Let them run. Get the defense in chase mode. And as they've done more of that, you're starting to see more and more big plays in the pass game. And I think those things are are have been a have been a positive for sure. So again, we get a lot of big picture questions here today. And uh Drew, I'm not going to we're not going to talk about the Bears head coaching position uh because this is Notre Dame, but I will say well, Chicago no, fans but are the, a little the, out there of was, control. No, no. There's a reason that I, there might be a reason he's bringing that up. There has been a couple rumors going around on some not Notre Dame related people, but some other people that say they have sources in Chicago that the Bears, one of the guys the Bears are looking at is Brian Kelly. Oh, for the love of goodness. So I wonder if uh, if that would be something they'd be interested in. So, well, Chicago I, fans, I should say a specific sect of college or of, of Bears fans have, have taken the fire Nagy thing a little too far chanting at Nagy's son's high that's school That's ridiculous. Game. That is so out of line. Yes. Um, I, I, I don't was, care what you think of Matt yeah. Nagy. Is, or, or, I, like, if, if I were to ever go to, like, when, when Brian Kelly's son was in high school, if I ever would have yeah. gone to his, his a game or any fan would have gone to a game and, like, said anything about Brian Kelly when Kenzel was playing, like, you're the biggest piece of you-know-what. Get out of here. Right. Yeah. Like that is so classless that it's not that kid's fault that the, and now it was it was the other team's parents. It was the, it was the visiting teams like. Right. Side right. So they whatever. were taunting yeah. the kid basically with the the dad that that is about as classless uh, in my that's opinion. Messed, as you, it's as messed you, up. As and the administration right. apologized and the principal. and uh, But still, man, it's like, yeah, sit down and think about what you're going to say before right. you say it man like that's just messed up but well, we're, we're seeing a lot of people that just seem to more and more and more just don't have a lot of respect for other people yeah at sporting events it's like we're seeing this new thing where i've seen it more this year than i've ever seen it where like these students actually just throwing bottles and stuff onto the field i've seen messed it up. multiple games it's like what is wrong with you because if you buy a ticket that like gives you permission to just yeah you know, do whatever you want like that's right not like okay so i'm kind of anti lebron james you know this Vince. i can't stand lebron james Me i too. never like lebron Me james too. Me too. And then I saw that video of him getting those fans kicked out. And I just like, like what a little, you know what? Like he's such a, he's so soft. Then you start hearing what those people were saying. I never like saw were saying, I hope that Bronny dies in a car wreck. Wow. You know what I mean? Like that's okay, his that's, kid. That's messed like, up. Like if that's actually what they said, you're a POS, you should be kicked out. Yes. About, you know, now LeBron kind of, you know, you, you'd like to say, Hey LeBron, you know, but, but, but look, you start talking about somebody's kid and it's messed dying, up, man. I don't know if I could have self control in that situation. Right, that's exactly right. So right. it's just, man, look, booing is fine. It's part of the game, right? Yeah. I mean, there's things that 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 you know. I don't know. I've never booted a game that I know of. Maybe when I was a little kid, but I don't remember ever booing at a game. But people have the right to boo. People have the right to have emotions and feelings because if people weren't passionate, then they wouldn't be paying money to come to sports, and we wouldn't have sports as we know it. But there is a line, and um, yeah, that that was pretty. That was pretty bad. Yeah, that was opinion. that was that was not okay. Um, anyway, okay. Uh, again, big big picture questions here from Tommy. Uh, nope, nope, not that one. Sorry. See, people are like Thanksgiving comes and people start getting real thoughtful and start. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Best guesses, guys. Who do you think fills the bigger head coach openings, and also who would fill those secondary openings? Oh gosh, yeah, right. <laughs> I, you know, it, what's funny is we were having this discussion at Irish Breakdown on the message board yesterday, and the the latest reports are that Dave Aranda is going to sign an extension at Baylor, and people are like, "What's going on here?" Because you have Mel Tucker turning down LSU and and USC to stay at. Michigan, Michigan State, State. And Dave Aranda's turning down USC, and, and there's a couple things. Number one is USC and LSU are overrated jobs. I've been saying this for a while, especially USC. When was the last time USC set their sights on a big name and went after him and got him? That's a good point. They they didn't never because would be the answer. They're usually going like their third and fourth and fifth options, you know, and, and because there's a lot of things that go into that job that it's not always what well, I got great or you know recruiting hotbed. Oh, okay, well. 
that's fine. But the other part of it too is these smaller schools, and I, I use smaller loosely because I'm more referring to reputation than I am size of the school, you know, like just from a football standpoint, like Baylor, Hugh Freeze just signed a big contract extension with Liberty. The re- reality is, is these schools are starting to pay more to where it's like, it used to be where like I jumped from Iowa State to Texas because I was like quadrupling my salary or I was tripling my salary. It was like, it was something where it was like, it, the money was so great that it's like, I'm making 300,000 at, at, at Iowa State and I can make 1.5 million at, at Texas. That's a huge difference 20 years ago, right? 10 years ago. Now it's like, okay, I'm turning down 5 million because I'm making three. And, and then you start looking into things like, okay, if I'm, if I'm making 5 million in Texas and I'm getting offered 7 million a year in LA, you start doing some economic conversations and that, that whole 5,000, 5 million is going to last me a lot longer in Texas than 7 million is going to last me in in LA. And job security too, right? That's part of it too. But I mean, but it's like Gary Patterson, I think set this agenda. It's like, Hey, look, you find a place that's treating you right. And, and they have high expectations, but not ridiculously unrealistic expectations where you can have a down year and then kind of rebuild the thing back up again. Those are good situations to be in. And, and and I think that's something that when Brian Kelly leaves and retires is going to make the Notre Dame more job more attractive because they were so patient with him through multiple things. You know, like, I mean, some of it in his control, some of it not. And I don't really want to mention the things not in his control because it, it tends to be a bit of a controversial topic. But a lot of places would have fired him over stuff like that. And and but you just get into these, these situations where like, if Baylor's going to pay Dave Aranda five, $6 million a year, that's a pretty good, that's a really good gig. Assuming you like living in Waco. So, True. True. um, you know, it, it's, I think so, there's something to be said for job security though, too. being able, like, especially if you have a family being able to, okay, I just signed a 10 year contract. And okay, just, I'm just throwing out a hypothetical, right? I, I don't know how Mel Tucker thinks, this is a hypothetical, okay? Maybe he enjoy he enjoys you know working in uh, in East Lansing. He knows that nine, eight to ten wins a season is going to keep people fairly happy in, in in East Lansing at the occasional vying for the Big Ten title, right? And he knows that if he has a young family, they're going to grow up in the same place for the next ten years. To me, that's important. And maybe you don't have a shot at that national championship, or maybe you don't. Maybe you have an outside shot at the national championship, but job security is huge, man. Job security is huge to me. And maybe that's mm-hmm. what some of these guys are thinking, you know, like, Hey, I signed a 10 year deal here. I'm going to be financially set, obviously. And then I know I'm not going to have to pick up and move my family around because right. to me, and I know you did it to me, moving around was the biggest deterrent to mm-hmm. me to being a college co- college coach. Mm-hmm. Because I just didn't want, I wanted to keep my right. family in one place. So, um, and that's just, like I said, this is me talking and I don't know if that goes into it, but I would assume that it probably has something to do with it now. So that means you have to try to do one of two things. If you're these programs like LSU, USC and Florida, who I think are the three biggest off the top of my head, the three yeah, biggest jobs agree. out there. So what you need to do is the first thing is, okay, what coach at a school that's like, like Baylor and Louisiana are different. Louisiana is not going to be able to take care of Billy Napier the way that Baylor can take care of Dave Aranda, in my opinion, nor is it the same caliber job. So Billy Napier now to me rises way up the list of coaches to be considered. And Billy Napier has an SEC background. He coached under Nick Saban and he's done a great job of Louisiana. I mean, he's got double, I think they won. I don't want to say this for, for certain, I believe they only lost one game last year. I just don't know if they played double-digit games. I believe they did, but I believe he won double-digit games last year. They're ten and one this year. Their only loss was the season opener Texas. They went ten and one last year. You're twenty and two in a two-year stretch, and your two losses were a three-point loss to Coastal Carolina, who was really good last year. Yeah, they were, and us in a, in a, a road loss to start your season against Texas. That's pretty good work. You're, you're a pretty good football coach. They just beat Liberty 42 to 14 last week. Liberty's a good football team with a quarterback that some people think is going to be a first round draft pick. So, 
you know, Vince, for me, I think that become he becomes more attractive. And then some of these, the other thing too, is that some of these extensions are, 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 all, are not necessarily guarantees that guys are going to stay. It's like, look, you can have me, but you're going to have to pay me a lot more than I'm making here. Yeah. There are also protections for the school to raise the buyouts. So that's the other thing is like, if you're going to leave, we're going to get a lot more from it. That's sure. part of these things too. So like Hugh Freeze getting an extension at Liberty, let's be honest. If LSU <laughs> came calling for Hugh Freeze, I think he'd probably listen, even though he just signed an extension. Not that they would ever do that, should ever do that. But I think so Billy Napier becomes a hotter commodity. So those coaches, J- J- does Jamie Caldwell become a hotter commodity now? The guy from Coastal Carolina, that's a that's an interesting one, right? Like he doesn't have a tremendous, long, successful resume. But, you know, he's he's obviously done a good job these last two years. They went 11-1 uh, and one last year. They are 9-2 and two this year. Lost by two to Texas, Georgia, uh, Georgia State, which is a bad loss. And then lost by three at App State. <clears throat> So those guys become more attractive to me. I think you now have to start looking harder and harder at coordinators, which is what makes it a little bit nerve wracking. I think maybe for some Notre Dame fans. And yeah, then you yeah. start looking at, can we, can we get a sort of a retread kind of guy? And that's, I think the worst case scenario, you know, can we, you know, can we hire, a, you know, a guy that's bought, you know, Bob Stoops or a, or a Butch Jones or, you know what I mean? Who just resigned from FIU. So those are things that, 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 um, that I look at and say, those are jobs that, that I would consider at this point in time or people that I would consider. Now, the other thing is, is okay. There's, there's still some coaches or places, you know, can, can Florida or, you know, can Florida convince Lane Kiffin to leave at Ole Miss? Can, can Miami do that? If my, cause I, the latest rumor is that Miami's going to move on from Manny Diaz and go hire, Mario Cristobal I mean the only reason I would ever make that move is just that's my home that's my alma mater I mean because there's those two jobs aren't even close in my opinion you know so then the Oregon job comes open right and then that's even worse for USC because right now I think Oregon's a more attractive job than USC is oh no question so it just it's going to get really interesting and this is why I'll say it for the millionth time you do not fire a coach unless you have an idea of who you're going to replace him with Unless he's doing things where it's like, like Ed Orgeron needed to be fired. There was, it, he didn't, he didn't just get fired in my opinion, because he wasn't winning. There's a lot of other stuff going on. And, and so that one, I completely understand Dan Mullen, unless there's things we don't know about, there was no reason to fire him right now. Right. Clay Helton. There was no reason to fire him right when you did, because again, it's just like you were, you, you went through this a year ago when you, tried to hire a new coach and nobody was interested. So you kept Clay Helton, you know, and you need to make sure somebody's interested first. So now what's happened is, is that is because you did it early, you do it early to try to find your new coach to get him in place in place right away, which is smart. But then the flip side of that is these coaches can use you for extensions, which is what's going on. Right. James Franklin used these other jobs. The guy's 11 and nine the last two years. And he's getting a 10 year contract extension. Why? You know, uh, Dave Aranda, Mel Tucker, they use these for contract extension. Hugh Freeze is barely even mentioned for these schools, and he used his to get a contract. He used it to get a contract extension, and you know. Liberty. I have Liberty. a bad feeling that Notre Dame's, that Brian Kelly's going to do the same thing, you know. Now, fortunately, Brian Kelly made some comments about he's not interested that would make it a little bit harder for him to then go renegotiate a new yeah. contract. It's like. Oh, you know, but that's always a concern that I have. But as far as who fills the bigger positions, Tommy, I don't have a clue because I don't really know right now who's interested in those jobs. I mean, you know, Matt Cam- is Matt Campbell super attractive to anybody right now? A guy that's not getting talked about a lot, and and if and if he gets if they beat Indiana today, is I think Jeff Brom's going to become a, 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 an attractive coach to some of these guys. Yeah, you because know, he's from Kentucky. He's got some, you know, he's recruited the South. You know, obviously when he was he already turned Kentucky. down his alma mater, though, right? Like, yeah, but he, Louis, let's be honest, Louisville and Florida are two completely different. Fair peoples. enough. Louisville's fair not enough. much of a step up from Purdue if it's a step up at all. And and just now, of course, at the time, Louisville was a better team, but that sure. doesn't make it necessarily a better program. And I think he's always kind of look. If you take the Louisville job, you can't leave it. You can't, you can't, you, you don't take your alma mater job and then leave it in three years, right? I mean, if you have plans of, of going to a bigger place, 
you take that job because it's your final job, essentially, is how I look at it. But, you know, Florida, I, I don't know if Jeff, I don't think Jeff Brown would fit in at LSU at all, but Florida, it's a, it's a pretty northern, southern area if you catch my drift you know it's not your t- it's not like baton rouge true you know, usc i don't know how jeff brahm would do out west but i mean a guy like him could become more attractive i'm just trying to look around i'm like there's just not a lot of great options right now exactly and and bob stoops, i wouldn't be in a hurry to fire my yeah, coach right and bob stoops is a guy that's going to be attractive but i think there's only one job bob stoops has come out of retirement for maybe two and and they're both in the Midwest, and they're not named LSU, and they're not named Florida, and they're not named, uh, they're USC. they're not named USC. Now here's a but see, then it comes down to okay, then you just got to buy a coach at that point in time. Okay, hey, you know Lincoln Riley, I know you don't want to leave leave Oklahoma, but here's twelve million dollars a year. Yeah, there's a blank check. You right. know, what do I, I mean, write here? You can yeah. do something like that, but then now you get in some really tough spots too because when you make that kind of money the expectations aren't that you just be competitive in the East. You know, it's you're, you, we're paying you $12 million a year at right. LSU. Our expectation is that you're going to start beating Bama. Okay. Good luck with that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or if you go to Florida, the expectation is, is you're going to start beating Georgia much easier said than done. So it's just, man, it's a, it's a real tough deal right now, man, especially the, now I think USC, it might actually in some ways could be in a better position than LSU because, the league they're in it's easier the path to success at usc we're just talking football the path to success at usc in my opinion is even easier than it is at florida or lsu because of what they have in front of them let's be honest 2019 at lsu was a fluke and everybody in coaching knows it it was a fluke because you look at the what orgeron did before and after and it was it was a fluke you just got lucky nobody thought joe burrow you 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 can't just assume you're going to get the next joe burrow and the grad transfer you know so I don't know. I mean, Vince, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but I'm looking around at these <clears throat> options I'm reading about and, and people are, are, are talking about, you know, this guy and that guy. And I'm like, like those aren't super attractive. Like, you know, Florida, tell me Florida fired Dan Mullen so they could end up with Dan Lanning, the D coordinator, Georgia. Now, look, I think Dan Lanning, for all I know, could do a great job. I don't know a lot about him other than this Georgia defense is really good. I always get real nervous when it's a, a – a def coordinator for a team whose head coach is also very involved on that side of the ball. Sure. So how much of it is him? And then Louisiana tech came open today too. skip Holtz got fired yeah, or they yeah. mutually agreed to set part ways. So Vince, there's just, I, I look at these and I just say, I don't know if any of these options are necessarily great options. And I don't know if these are guys that you should have fired Dan Mullen for. I mean, again, Dan exactly. Mullen's had a, a rough year, meaning like going back to the LSU loss last year to now, but man, I mean, he had you rolling pretty good before that, right? I, I mean, it, it so is like, is there more to it than just the the recent things? It's 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 really strange, man. It's really strange because I just, I mean, they're Virginia Tech with Justin Fuente. They might actually be in the best position, in my opinion. Virginia Tech might actually be in the best position because at Virginia Tech, you don't have to get a big name. You could go get the guy that used to be at James Madison, who's now at uh, at, at ECU, right? Uh, you can go try to get – it's going to be a lot easier for you to buy Dave Clawson from Wake Forest than it's going to be for you to to buy Lincoln Riley from Oklahoma, right? I mean – About a third, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, gosh. Uh, he can't way, be breaking yes. the bank at Wake Forest. Right, right. So I just – I look at all these kind of things, and Mike Houston's the guy's name. Mike Houston's the head coach at East Carolina. They, he's done a really nice job there. Uh, I think this is his second year at ECU. Let me let me look that up. But he was at James Madison before that. Well, that's a Virginia school. And and he had some good success there. So, that, you know, those are things you can look at, Vince, and say maybe, no, this is his third year at ECU. So, uh, and they're having a nice year. They're seven and four this year. He won a national championship at James Madison, had two 14 and one seasons, uh, were runners up the next year. So, He's a guy that's that's you know maybe he's an attractive he's, option. He's an ascending like guy, that. yeah. And it's easier to make that kind of hire at James Matt at, at at Virginia Tech or even at TCU, sure, than it is at LSU, Florida, or you. You don't yeah, fire Dan Mullen right. to hire you know Mike Houston, right? I don't think the boosters would like that's that. A big, very that's much. a big jump. I mean, right, it's a big but jump. Virginia Tech doing that eh, makes a little bit more sense. Absolutely, it does. You know. And so those are the things you look at, Vince, and you say, okay, 
where where are they going to go with this? Sure. Right. And, and and you start hearing all these names being thrown. You start like Bill O'Brien's name starts getting thrown around. Good luck to the school that 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 hires Bill O'Brien to be their head coach. You know, like come on, give me a break. But you know that's yeah. why he went. That's why he went to Alabama to be the coordinator, right? right. I mean, so oh, of course, that's why he did somewhere. it. Yeah, that's you of know. course why he did it. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't take that job. He this didn't leave a, the NFL to go to Alabama just to hang look, out with Nick Saban for the next five years. This, this is a great opportunity for Bill O'Brien to get a head coaching job someplace because there's so many openings and the pool of good candidates, of candidates, period, is just not that deep. And so, look, Bill O'Brien's got a resume, right? So, And he's he's a quote-unquote name, whether that's good or bad in your opinion. Uh, not I'm not saying you, like in anybody's opinion. He's a name, and... Mm-hmm. I could see him jumping ship after one year at Alabama. I absolutely mm-hmm. could because there's so many openings. You know who I would give a call to if I was Virginia Tech? I'd call Mike Elko. Mm. He'd be a top candidate for me because he's he's coached in that league before. He's had good success as a coordinator. He's from Jersey. He's recruited the East Coast. He went to Penn. He's a really smart guy. He could recruit the North. He can obviously recruit the Mid-Atlantic. He's done a great job building up Texas A&M's defense, in my opinion. That's the only sure. reason they're good this year, in my opinion, is because of their defense. He'd be a guy that I would look at. He'd be one of the top assistant coaches that I would look at. But I don't know if Mike Elko's a Florida, LSU, USC guy, but yeah. definitely a TCU, even more so Virginia Tech, because even though he's in Texas now, his entire coaching tree is more of the East sure. Coast kind of thing, and he's from Jersey and all that kind of stuff. If I were him, I would like that Virginia Tech job even more than the TCU job because, number one, Virginia Tech is going to be in a conference that you know is going to remain a Power 5 conference, and you can't you can't make that – you don't know that about the Big 12 right. because there's so much more uncertainty in the Big 12. And so that, that TCU yeah. job becomes a little less attractive. ACC schools are going to be getting more money. You know, you're, you're more certain that an ACC school is going to get more money in five years than a Big 12 school is because Texas and Oklahoma are leaving. And so I think there's that would be for me in a, a very attractive job for me if I was Mike Elko. You know, then you start looking at a guy that whose whose star has kind of fallen a little bit. Is it now time for Tony Elliott to make that jump and in, in for a job? You know, would he be someone who may now be interested in that Virginia Tech job? So I think Virginia Tech's actually, in my opinion, in a better place to get a to get a coach that people are going to be happy with. Sure. Than those other programs. Well, that's good. That makes that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. But I mean, USC can't go that route. Like USC can't hire Mike Elko. Now, it doesn't mean that they shouldn't. Uh, number one, I don't know if Mike Elko would have any interest in that job. I'm just making a point. Like, I don't think that would be received all that well because this is the problem with a lot of those big schools. They have a very unrealistic expectation for it's like worse than arguing Notre Dame fans to say, boy, you know, this job is better than you think it is. You know, like, oh, Notre Dame, you know, there's a lot of Notre Dame fans who've accepted that Notre Dame's just not Ohio State anymore. It's not Alabama anymore. It just makes me want to cry sometimes. It's like, yes, it is, you know. And so maybe I'm one of those delusional fans on the side of Notre Dame. But there's a lot of USC fans that like and, and more so money people that are like, USC should be good. Here's the difference between the two. USC should be good because we're USC. Notre Dame says we can't rely on that anymore. Notre Dame went through that for a long time. We should be good because we're Notre Dame. Then they realize, you know what? We have to invest. We have to spend. Yeah. We can't just rely on our tradition anymore. We have to spend. Right. And USC hasn't been willing to do that. And and that makes it interesting. But it's it it the other thing that that it's hurt these schools. And we're, I'm actually having reason we're, I'm having fun talking about. It. I love talking about this kind of stuff. But the re, the other thing about it too, Vince, is you kind of got there's a lot of hot names before the season whose teams have had down years. Iowa State, Matt Campbell being the biggest one. Yep. You know, he was a guy that was kind of on everybody's radar and, and oh, you know, he's going to be the next you know, big head yeah. coach to yep. go. And, you know, like here's my question is, is if Matt Campbell was having a better year, would Penn State have been as willing to do what it took to hang on to James Franklin? I think another thing, too, is I think a guy like Luke Fickle, I, I think Luke Fickle's I think I would I would expect that he would be more apt to use this as an extension time it's and get it's like because luke fickle's smart now again i don't want him to replace brian kelly but that doesn't mean i don't think he's a really good football coach but luke fickle's a smart dude he's going to use all these openings and and to to say hey i'm not so so much concerned about you paying me more although uh, an extension would be nice if you look at what we've done last two years but i need to get more commitment from you to build the program up 
facilities. Th- that's that's how a smart coach uses these these conversations, Vince. Sure, is a guy like Luke Fickle, but you know, Sonny Dykes is at, at TCU. That's that one makes a lot of sense. You know, he's at SMU now. Those those kind of jobs to me are going to be easier to fill than the big three, so to speak, or actually, and really the big four, because you throw Washington in there. That's a big job nobody's talking about a lot right now. That's a good job, in my opinion. And, and then if Washington and Oregon come open, then it gets real interesting. And here's a here's a name that I'm not hearing really or reading about is the guy at BYU. He's done a really nice job. Good now point. again, it's his alma mater. He may not be interested in leaving. He may want to stay at BYU. But man, that's a guy that you. I'm surprised I'm not hearing more about. I I, I really am. Yeah, I, I really am. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah, we got some super chats I want to get to. I don't want people to think we're we forgot about them, but I know no, I, I know just like Brian, I, shut up. When I pull the string up about on this. Brian's back about coach openings, I know it's going to go for What's well, a, a fun conversation, I, especially on a Friday, hey, you know. I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. I I just I know you and I know where you're going to go for the most part. All right, Brian Medved has a super sticker. Thank you, Brian. Really appreciate he had, it. He had a he had a didn't Brian have a, a follow-up right underneath that uh, right about above the, it. the movie right thing? Right above it. Uh, he says, uh, Brian and Vince name this football movie, Nickerson. You know, you are not God. You are, you're just a high school football coach. You're just a typing teacher. Clap, clap, no help from the gallery. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that's all the right moves with Tom, with, uh, Tom Cruise. Never saw and, that. And, uh, Craig T. Nelson is the head okay. coach. Um, good, good movie, Brian. You need to see, this. see, I need to bring you some, I need to bring you all the right moves. I just I have never liked Rocky football all movies all that much. Right. Like. I mean, some of I've some of my I mean, Rudy was a good one, but that wasn't really about football as much as it was about you know, uh, underdog story. And, and, and and I guess I you know necessary roughness, but that was more of a comedy kind of thing. That was that. Like I didn't like the comedy. program as much as a lot of people did. You okay. know, like it was good, but it's like okay. Remember I, the Titans. Remember the Titans was great, but again, that wasn't necessarily a football movie. Okay, right? that was that more was, of a history. Right. Well, I've gotten away with showing it in history class when I was younger. Right, you know and, and so you know. So yeah, it just I don't know. Like I didn't like uh any given Sunday. I hated I that like, movie. I did not like that because if they would have what I understand with that movie, they had a deal with the NFL to use NFL teams mm-hmm. and it fell through at the last minute. So they had those mm-hmm. ridiculous uniforms and the ridiculous all I mean, well, and they just made, made every, pl- every player is like this, you know, drug addicted, steroid yeah. using, yeah, misogynist. You know, and I it's like I, I got a friend of mine that played for the Chargers for a few years, and he's like, you know, he's like, man, we hated, we hate how the media and how Hollywood portrays the NFL. He's like, because he's like, is there that element in the NFL? Of course, of course there are. Of course there are guys that party all the time. He's like, but you know, that's maybe maybe twenty percent of your team. Exactly. Like the rest of us are guys making league minimum that just go home to our families and right. you know, it's a job. And, and yeah, he's like, but the media f- focus on those those guys that are you know having all these kids and these guys that are getting in trouble and Ryan leaf. Cause he played with Ryan leaf at the time. And he's like, that's not how most NFL players are, but that's yeah. how they're portrayed. Like, and that's what I hate about any given Sunday is like the whole in professional sports is just these, these just really bad dudes. And then the other thing, the one thing I did like about it, it was the most realistic game action, the chaos of game of playing. Yeah, like just the crazy cam. Like some people, oh, I hated it, and I'm like, yeah, okay, you may have hated that, and it kind of made me want to throw. But that's the most realistic yeah. of what it's like being on a football field. Sure, sure, sure. It sure. really was. It really was. Other uh, than that, it was a stupid that. movie. <laughs> I thought uh, Friday Night Lights. Did you ever watch that movie? I think I've asked you this before. Yeah, I didn't mm-hmm. think so. I Nor have I watched the show. Yeah, that's even worse. <laughs> it's a <the> worse offense <laughs> to me. <laughs> When I okay. watch TV, it's to get a it's it's an escape. It's to get away from football. It's well, it's just an escape from my job, and my job has always been football, yeah. right? For That's the most true. part. So yeah, coaching. It's kind of like I want to watch Blue Bloods or Navy SEAL Team or something that's like not. Oh, this is relates to my job somehow. You know, <laughs> it's kind of weird that way, but that's all right. I Whatever. Okay. Jordan uh, Rangel says, first time being able to watch live. Love the show and what you guys do. Any insight on CJ and Walker, uh, where they stand? What are your thought? What your thoughts are? And where does ND go if one or both the commit? And thank you for the super chat, Jordan. Yes, thank you, Jordan. Uh, more in Walker, I don't know. I kind of feel like the longer this has played out, the better it's been for Notre Dame. I think the longer he stays committed and doesn't flip 
the better. I mean, look, we're we're less than a month away from the early signing period. Yeah, now, yeah. Right? Anybody that's committed, you would anticipate that they're going to sign. I mean, that's, right? Yeah. And you know, so CJ Williams has talked about taking official visits, talking to sources. There's still confidence that he's going to stay, but it's not what it was a month ago. Uh-huh. It's just going to be about you got to convince him that there's a reason to stay. And now part of that's going to be making some moves at quarterback, right? Because that's something that that. Other schools have kind of put that in his ear, like, who's going to be throwing you the ball, right? And sure, I don't think C.J. Williams is aware of how good Tyler Buckner can be because Tyler didn't play last year. And then this yeah. year they're just pe- primarily mo- using him as a as a runner. So I, I get it. Steve Angeli's not going to, whoa, gee, I want to go play with Steve Angeli. That's not a knock on Steve Angeli. This is facts. This is reality. Yep. And and so I think teams are using that. And I, I I, I'm again, I, I don't want to get too much into this because I, I need to get better sources on this. But there is some concern that this is a lot like the Deion Colsey situation where the primary recruiter just didn't pay as much of attention to him as the schools trying to flip him have. Just can't do. All right. And and so that's a problem. But there's a, he does have a good connection with Tobias Merriweather. Tobias is very solid. And which is good news. So I, I'm still optimistic they can keep him, but not nearly as optimistic as before. The, the, this 2022 recruiting class is gonna is gonna fizzle, sadly. At the end, they're not gonna get Xavier Nwampa. I, I don't know what's going on with Billy Shrouth right now. That they're not gonna get Lucas or Hero Canoe. You know they're gonna. The, it didn't. It's still gonna be a top ten class for sure. Uh, I did. I was told too that uh, Junior Tua Amaka had a story with the West Coast. I think it was Greg Biggins, where he said, "I'm 100% solid in Notre Dame." I've reached out to sources about that. They're very confident Junior staying in the class. They don't think there's anything to worry about there. It's more so the receiver situation, and then that's also why you know Brian Kelly's going to have to make some tough decisions if Notre Dame's not in the college football playoff. Brian Kelly's going to have to make a move at wide receiver as soon as the season's over with, in my opinion. He's gonna, or at least let the players know. Look, here's here's what's going on because you can't you, you can't continue to do this. You're you you got kids transferring off your coach. Yeah, I'm talking about coach. Yeah, yeah. you know you, you you can't have you can't be losing a, a, a half of your depth chart almost in one off season. Right. You can't you can't be in situations where you're losing kids like that this late. Are there guys they can go after? Sure. There's the kid that's committed to Wake Forest. They could go flip it. They sh- they could they could go get Xavier Bradshaw, which clearly they don't like. There's there's other kids that they're talking to, but none of those guys are CJ Williams, and that's the whole point. And you know that's, that's why you can't have these losses. You you right. just can't. You just you just can't. And it keeps happening at the same position. And and I don't exactly. know why people aren't willing to admit that. Like it. Yeah. Keeps having the same position. Brandon has a super chat. Thanks, Brandon. He says, have you watched any film on Croy Stewart with Nwamka probably going to Iowa? It's looking like Notre Dame is going to try to flip him from UCLA. Uh, He should be at Tom's game. Tomorrow's game. Thank you. I was like, who's Tom? (laughs) Tom Lloyd's got a game tomorrow? What's what's that? Some charity event or something? What's going on? (laughs) Um, Tomorrow's game. Makes sense. I have. He's a nice player. He's a nice player. He's not Xavier Nwokpo. Right. He, he, you know, he's a good player, but it's not, he's not, he's kind of like, a lot like what they already have. I mean, honestly, Brandon. He's a kid that's committed to UCLA is for people that didn't catch that. But. Right. Craig Sebring also with a super chat. Thanks, Craig. He says, that's why I laughed at Penn State giving James Franklin 75 million. And when Kirk Herbstreet said Brian Kelly should take the USC job. Why would Brian, like, okay, listen. My my people know my thoughts on Brian Kelly and, and you know personal or professional or whatever. Like Brian Kelly's done a very good job in Notre Dame. I can understand why schools want him. I don't think he's the kind of coach that Notre Dame has to give a ten year contract extension to because it, he's kind of this is who he is. Until he shows he can make the necessary changes to take him to the next step, this is who he is, right? But who he is is still one of the ten best coaches in college football, right? he's way better than what USC would be, right? So it makes sense why USC would want to pursue Brian Kelly. Why in the world would Brian Kelly want to take that job? He's an East Coast guy. Like Notre Dame, I believe, is literally the furthest West place he's ever coached. He he would not fit in in LA. He would not deal well. He is a control freak. 
which is not an insult. There's a lot of football coaches. Nick Saban's a control freak. So anyone that's taking that as an insult, it's not. It's most coaches are. You can't be a control freak at USC. It's just not possible. You're gonna when Will Farrell or Snoop Dogg wants to come to practice, what do you say? Sorry, Snoop. You know what I mean? Like that's just right. the reality of coaching yeah. at USC. Yep. And it's one of the many things that I don't think makes it as good of a job as people think. Like some people think that's a good thing. I don't. And so I, there's no way Brian Kelly would consider it'd be a, it, it'd be a great move for USC. It'd be a terrible move for Brian Kelly. And Brian Kelly is no dummy. I, I think there is one college job. I do think would make sense for Brian Kelly if the money was right. Cause he did say in that thing, like, Hey, if somebody wants to throw me $250 million, you know, I, I do think he can, there is a price. I don't think Brian Kelly's ever viewed Notre Dame as a destination job because that's why Brian Kelly has tried to leave three different times. Yeah. It's just that people didn't want him, right? At the end of the day, he's tried to leave for the NFL after 2012, no matter how he spends it. He if if he would have got offered certain jobs in the NFL, he'd have taken them. He tried to leave after 2016. And there was one other time, and I can't remember what year it was, where he his agent was trying to pursue NFL jobs. 2016, he was trying to pursue any job. He just wanted out, which I understand. So I think the Florida job would be the one to keep an eye on if Brian Kelly were looking to leave. I don't think that he is at this point in time. I don't. I think Brian Kelly's next move is going to be to retire. I, I think I, yeah. I, I think the, that, that kind of moment has passed. But what I am saying is if there was a school – that wanted to, if they wanted Brian Kelly, that I think the, the interest would be mutual. If the money was right, it'd be Florida. Cause Brian Kelly's always talked about, I mean, he has a, he already has a house in Florida, right? I mean, that's where he conducted his national coaching search from after the 2019 season was from his place in Florida, from what I'm told. Which, and, okay. and, and no, it's not okay. Why is that not okay? To, Cause you're not meeting with coaches, you're not bringing them to Notre Dame, you're not going through the process of a real coaching search. You can do a lot of the preliminary stuff from home. That's not you a search. That's not a natural he national anybody search. Anybody in person? No. It was all done from distance in Florida. Okay. Well, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. But you can do the the vast no, majority that's of the fine. work. No, while you're on vacation. That's, that's you can do I that meant. while you're in the Bahamas okay. on vacation. That's, that's what I was referring no. to. If no, I'm trying to on... lure a coach to my university, I'm going to let him come to the university and we're going to have right. talk. I'm going to have face. real conversations yeah, okay. about it. I'm not okay. interviewing him from distance, okay. or and I'm definitely not having him. And I'm saying this happened. I also wouldn't have him come to my place in Florida. No, right? True. Like, you know, I mean, I'm not saying he did that. I'm just like making the point that you okay. need to you need to you need to be at your school. You need to be where you have all your resources. You need to be where you have your AD right there and you can bring your people together and you can meet with the board if you need to. I mean, some of those things you can do remotely, but I'm, you know, it's just ridiculous. However, that would be an interesting one for him to look at. I I'm again, we're just having a fun conversation a here. Conversation. I'm not saying Brian Kelly's interested in Florida. I'm right. not saying Florida's interested in Brian Kelly His agent played at Florida. So, I mean, there'd be a connection there. I just said, because you know how there are some people that like, you know, the, the people that always give the negative check marks, you know, the people that are just obsessed with yeah. being angry. So they watch this show. Uh, they're going to go run to the other message boards. Driscoll said Florida's, you know, Kelly's like, no, not saying that. We're having a fun <laughs> Friday free for all conversation. I said, if there was a job that I think Brian Kelly would look at, if they were interested and were willing to offer enough, it would be Florida. Sure. But I also said, make sure you hear this. I think this is the last coaching job Brian Kelly has. That's that's what I think. So, uh, but yeah, James Franklin getting a, a ten year extension after going eleven and nine is just comical. Yeah, yeah it's really comical. Because I don't think anybody wanted him at this point in time. The way I the last two seasons. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't again, think there was a lot of excitement at USC for James Franklin. I would have loved for him to go to USC, but I I did not really necessarily see that happening. So, yeah. Okay, John A1 says, just joining. Thank you, John, for the super chat. Happy Friday, IB. What is the state of the offensive line going into the postseason? Bottom half, middle, 25 to 50, or top 15 to 25? I'd probably say 25 to 50, but on the sort of the middle the part 40s. of that. Yeah, 30s 40s. and 40s. Yeah, yeah, that's what I would say. 
Wow. It's That's just again part than I thought you were going to go. I mean, just look, you, you you don't run for the yards they've run the last month if you suck still. They've gotten better. It's they just they're still not they're anywhere close to what they should be. Yeah. They've definitely gotten better. And you know, but it, it you say, well, they've played bad teams, true, but Toledo wasn't very good up front and they dominated Notre Dame. They've gotten yeah. better. It's just they're still not great and they're still not a team that matches up with some of the better teams on the they're not schedule. a championship offensive line, that's for sure. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, agreed. Oh, here's another one from Jay. Jay, thank you very much for the super chat. He says, I hope BK goes after Keenan Bailey from Ohio State. Why? Wide receiver coach. I, I don't get this. He's not even a full-time. You've, you're going to have two coaches that have never been on your staff, that have never been Division One coaches. He's the assistant to the assistant, right? He's Dwight Schrute of Ohio State football <laughs> coach. I mean, I don't understand this. Like, He's not even the wide receivers he, coach. He, he graduated saying. from Notre Dame, right? And, and and I've heard a lot of good things about Keenan Bailey, and, and I've had some conversations with Keenan Bailey off the record. And uh, he, no, no, you're going to take Brian Hartline's assistant at Notre Dame? Seriously? A guy that's not a – well, you know, he works with – Brian Hartline's the receiver's coach. Brian Hartline is the reason. Well, if you bring him in, you can get Cardinal Tate. So? No, hire a great receiver's coach, somebody that's a proven track record as a coach and as a recruiter. Don't hire some young – I don't understand this infatuation. I don't know if, like, some recruiting analysts has start talking about this guy or whatever, kind of like there was one – who was it, like Wilt Fong or something? Some other, Notre Dame needs to hire – uh, uh, who was it? Uh, Kurt Francis kid or something like that, like Brian Madison or somebody like that. They're off in the corner. I'm like, why? Cause you know him and he'd give you sources. Get out of here with that. I don't understand why there's this infatuation with Keenan Bay, Keenan Bailey, who again, I think good young coach. If Notre Dame could bring him in as a GA or an assistant, fine, go for it. But you can't have your safeties and your receiver coaches be these young dudes that have never coached football before. I mean, I, you know, could he do a good job? Maybe. I don't know. That's the whole point. We don't know. Right. And I need to see him coach somewhere first. But this is Notre Dame. Right. Are you kidding me? Raise you're going to your, you're gonna give your 29 year old offensive coordinator who needs good coaches around him, you know, which any young coordinator needs. You're going to give him a guy that's never been a position coach. Like at the Division One level, he's been an assistant to a position coach. Are you kidding me? He's the quality control coach at Ohio State. If Notre Dame starts poaching Ohio State's quality control coaches to be coaches at a position like wide receiver, I, I don't get it. I, I've, I've had like 10 people in the last week say, oh, I need to go after Keenan Bailey. Why? Why? Explain that to me. I, Jay, I'm curious why you think that. I, I'm, I'm genuinely curious why you think that. I don't get this. I don't get this. He's not even like if it was like if he was the full time receivers coach, sure. But no, I, I don't understand this. I don't understand this at all. So, yeah. Some somebody asked in here, and I was trying to look it up, but I was una- I'm not I'm not quick enough with the Google. Uh, Christopher says, "What was Urban Meyer before Notre Dame?" As a position coach, like, as is like, yeah, from his resume standpoint, he was at Colorado I, State, I believe. Is that where it was? Where he, where he, yes, okay. I believe I'm going to look that up. I couldn't look it up fast enough. You're you're faster than yeah. I am at that kind of stuff. Yeah, he was a he was at Colorado State, I believe, before came Notre Dame. Yeah, he was at Colorado State for six seasons under Sonny Lubick. He was the receivers coach at Colorado State for six years. He was the quarterbacks receivers coach at Illinois State the year before that. Coached linebackers at Illinois State the year before that. So he had seven eight years and then he was a ga at ohio state for two years so he was he was yeah i found yeah, i finally I mean, found yeah. it so i'm looking right at yeah. it he, he, he was had, colorado state for six years before he yeah. came to notre dame yeah and and notre dame at wide receivers coach at notre dame was his last stop before he became a head coach so he was well on his way by by the time you know <laughs> that he came to notre dame right so that's important to understand as well that's all the super chats we have, so I'm gonna fly back to the top. Yeah, yeah, we we'll get to some of these receiver things a little bit here too. Okay, I just if again, you see I don't, something. Go ahead and pull it. I up. had a couple of people say he's an upgrade. That's not saying a whole lot. I don't right. want an upgrade over Del Alexander. That doesn't say much. I want someone who is going to be one of the who's going to move the needle as a coach and as a recruiter. I just I don't see what Keenan Bailey does in that regards. I. We have no idea what he can do as a recruiter because he's not allowed to recruit. Right. Well, because we heard the same thing about Chris O'Leary, right? Like, you sure. know, well, he can. He Yes, he can. He can recruit. On campus. 
right? Well, and they can make calls. I mean, okay. they just can't. The only thing that they can't do is go on the road. Right. Right. Because you can only have so many coaches on the road. Right. But they can recruit, and especially nowadays, they can be very involved with these kids. But again, it's one thing to be in that role. It's another thing to be a full time position coach where kids are coming to play for you. Because right now, you're convinced that kids go a receiver to go play for Brian Hartline, not for you. Right. And, and so I just. I don't need an upgrade over Dell Alexander. I need them to get one of the best. And I don't know, maybe he is, was at Notre Dame around the same time Tommy Reese was. I don't know. Maybe they're friends, even more reason not to bring him in. Right. You need yeah. someone with different ideas. Yeah. Someone that comes with experience of developing receivers and say, well, who, who would I like? There's a plenty of guys out there, plenty of guys out there. Same with the old line coach. There's plenty of good coaches out there that actually, you know, that they can coach. You're not taking a, a guess on you know, no, I'm sorry. No, no. Mm. And that's okay. nothing against Keenan Bailey, because if I was like, if I was, if I was, let's say Tommy Reese just hypothetically got the head coaching job at Virginia Tech, just to make a point, I would call Keenan Bailey up. Absolutely. Absolutely. If I was at a place like Purdue, I would call Keenan Bailey up. I think Keenan Bailey has a bright future as a coach. But I need to see him prove it first. Sure. The difference with Chris O'Leary is Notre Dame got to see firsthand every day what Chris O'Leary could do. That's different than what you're being told by a rival school that he can do. Yeah, right. So that, that's I just important too. Yeah, I just yeah. Mm -mm. Can't do it. Jeff Luke has a question back up towards the top. He says, Vince, I was wondering if there's any music changes between the third and fourth quarter during day games, like the light show during the night games. They, they play that, that, and I don't know what the name of the song is because music isn't really my thing, but something where they ask everybody to jump around, uh, but it's not jump around like at Wisconsin. It's a different jump around song, and then they still play the 1812 Overture. Uh, that's it. So, I mean... Not really. Is yeah, the let's, answer? You know, let's let's pattern our third quarter Maybe. thing after Wisconsin. Let's yeah. hire Ohio State's assistance to the assistance. I mean, yeah, yeah that exactly. makes total sense. Yeah, you know, makes total sense. Absolutely. Do you want to grab that super chat at the bottom so I can sure. stay up here and look for the next it's from one? John Rich. Here we go. John Rich, thanks for the super chat. John, he says, what coaches were hired as head coaches? But we're much better as assistants and should have oh, never gosh. been a head coach. There's got to be a long, long list of that. I mean, just I'm thinking of some guys. I mean, the, a bunch of Florida head coaches come to mind. <laughs> like Florida hired four straight guys just like that: Jim McElwain, um, Charlie Strong, uh, Will Muschamp. Uh, he, he, those are all guys that come to mind. Steve Adazio is another guy that comes to mind, better position coach than he was a head coach. Clearly. I mean, that list is very long, John, very, <laughs> very, very, very long. Uh, somebody said down there said Steve Sarkeesian that remains to be seen, but as of right now, he's obviously had more success as a position coach and coordinator, not just at Alabama, but even at USC, he was sure. a position coach in the NFL. You know, he's obviously had a lot of success as an assistant. He hasn't had – he's had one good year as a head coach. And that was a – that was, what, a 2014 USC team that still, I think, lost four games. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's a very – that's a fair. I, mm -hmm. Tom Herman is one. Tom Herman's another guy that comes to mind. That's why I think Brent Venables has been so smart. Is Brent Venables like, I got a good thing going here. Coaching my kids. I'm making a lot of money. And – you know, I've heard there's other issues yeah. with him though too, but I don't know. There's some other things, that. but he if he wanted to be a head coach, he could have found <laughs> he could have he could have been a head coach somewhere. Okay. But he's turned down even I'm told he's even turned down like interviews. Like he just doesn't even really have an interest, especially now that his kids are there. Yeah, right. Yeah, he's not going anywhere. Yep. Notre Dame 2164 says, just talking pure athleticism, is Notre Dame now on an equal footing with the elites of college football? Not top to bottom i think they're starting to get there at the top you know you have guys like kyle hamilton you have guys like you know you've had will fuller in recent years jalen smith they've had some guys uh i think athletically on offense notre dame's about as good as anybody but i think that they still need more depth of, of top athletes on it. and there are also positions where i don't think notre dame is, is quite there yet i'm sorry i got an eyelash in my eye i think <laughs> I, I think secondary product. wise, Notre Dame is not on the level of Bama and, and some of those other top Georgia. Uh, they have obviously one great one, but that's an area where 
uh, the, I would argue the biggest upgrade needs to happen. I would argue the same thing about linebacker. I think that's where Clark Lee's recruiting, I think, has not been good in recent years, is they just – they don't have the depth of athleticism. I mean, Prince Colley gives you a lot of optimism, Maris Lewifow, but overall you've got – You've got Drew Whites and J.D. Burch who are good football players, but not the kind of elite athlete you see at, at the bigger schools. And so that's what makes this 2014 or 2022 class so important. Benjamin uh, has one here about Kyron Williams. He says, I've been watching a lot of film of Kyron Williams. Reminds me of Maurice Jones-Drew. Your thoughts? Love the show. I think it's a good one, Benjamin. I mean, similar body type, right? Short, low, big, strong legs. I think Maurice was a little thicker than Kyron. Yeah. Uh, neither were burners, but but had really good suddenness, good make you miss guys, could run you over. What I don't remember about about Maurice Jones, Maurice Jones Drew, and again, this isn't saying he was or wasn't. I just don't remember him as a pass catcher. I don't. Again, I'm not saying he wasn't. I'm actually going to look up his stats now. So again, it's it's not comparing. It's not saying he wasn't. It's just I just honestly don't remember what he was in college as a pass catcher. Because when I try to when I try to do references with guys, I try to look at what they were in college. Sure. So I'm looking at Maurice's stats. He wasn't much of a pass catcher's first two years, but his junior year, he had 31 catches for 453 yards. That's very Kyron esque, definitely. So that would be a that would be a good comparison. I'd say Kyron's probably a little bit of a of a more natural runner than Maurice June Jones Drew was in college. But yeah, I like that comp, Benjamin. It's a real good comp. Where did he go to college? UCLA. UCLA. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. Mike Nolan says concerning the playoff, will any of these talking heads point out how Notre Dame played six teams, five in a row, who had an open date before Notre Dame? No top 25 team even close. I don't care if they talk about that or not, because I think that's an overrated thing to focus yeah, on. I, I don't look, I, I, this has become like something that Notre Dame fans just love to talk about. I don't think it matters that much. I mean, again, a lot of those teams weren't even that good. I, I just, it, and I just don't think it mattered. I don't think Cincinnati beat Notre Dame because they had a bye week. They didn't beat Notre Dame because they came up with extra stuff, right? Or they had guys hurt that needed to get healthy. They beat Notre Dame because they outcoached Notre Dame and outplayed Notre Dame, and they were more mentally and emotionally ready to play that game. And it was because of a bye week. That was more about Notre Dame not showing up. I mean, Cincinnati scored twenty four points. They are forty. They score forty a game. Right. Now that, that game was more about Notre Dame than it was Cincinnati. I just think the bye week thing is just overplayed. I. I, I just. It's just not that big of a deal to me. What I think is funny that I would like to see the committee talk more about is a lot of these teams need a conference championship game to play as many FBS teams as Notre Dame. There you go. Year. That's what's never talked about. Right. That never gets brought up. Mm -hmm. I, I see it on Twitter every now and again, but it's mostly from Notre Dame fans. But that is never brought up from mm -hmm. the national audience ever, mm -hmm. ever, 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 ever. And yeah. I, I think that's a problem. Because how would they feel? And this is this was behind the tweet that I put out the other day. How mm -hmm. would they feel if Notre Dame's 13th data point, if Notre Dame next weekend during conference championship week played Southwest Missouri State or right. Mercer or New Mexico State, who actually is an FBS team, but they're awful, or Austin P or Murray State or Prairie View AM or Charleston Southern, right? Right? How would they feel if that, that played right. big time power five? That's right. Team. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. I, yep. And I, you know what would happen? I can tell you exactly what would happen. Notre Dame would get banged for doing that. Oh, look mm -hmm. who they're finishing up the season with while everybody else is playing a conference championship. There you go. That's what would. That's what they. That's would right. Say. That's absolutely right. Because so. it, it's just it's silly. <laughs> it's silly. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Wade has a super chat down there at the bottom, Brian. There we go. Daniel, thank you very much for the super chat. He says, when it comes to national perception, will Notre Dame ever get a fair shake? In the playoff, who else beats Bama, Clemson, Ohio State, et cetera, other than Ohio State, Clemson, and Bama? Yeah, I get tired of that argument, though, from Notre Dame fans, too, because you're Notre Dame. You're you're basically telling us that Notre Dame's not those programs. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, right? Okay, then do what you need to do to start beating those teams. First of all, no, Notre Dame's never going to get a fair shake from the media because of million reasons. Get right? used to it. When the when the when ESPN will start giving Notre Dame a fair shake is when Notre Dame signs a contract with ESPN. That's when they're going to start being yeah. fair to Notre Dame. Good point. And they'll be fair enough to Notre Dame when it becomes a story, right? If Notre Dame is clearly a playoff team, 
they will love Notre Dame, love Notre Dame because it sells. It makes them money. When it's when it's when Notre Dame is a borderline playoff team, they're going to do exactly what they're doing now because it's number one. There's a clear built-in bias with some of these guys. I'm like listening to Joe Tessitore and Greg McElroy talk about Notre Dame last night. I'm like, you guys are clueless. Like, I don't understand how these. Like, can you please stop hiring former players just because they're former players? If they have bad take after bad take, like Emmanuel Acho is awful. Like Greg McElroy is one of the dumbest smart people around. Like it just like his takes are so bad. You know what I mean? Like David Pollock, you know, Booger McFarlane. Like just stop hiring these former players just because they're former players, right? Hire former players that like are smart. Like, right, you know, get Jonathan Vilma up there instead of David Pollock because he always has better takes. I know he works for I think CBS now or something. I don't know. But like it's 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 annoying. It's super annoying with these bad takes. But it's always going to be the case, and I kind of like it. I kind of like having that because it's much easier if Brian Kelly would do it more and stop like getting mad at the Notre Dame media and start looking at like, the national media. It would be super easy for him to develop this us-against-the-world mentality because of how they're perceived. But he's always chasing ESPN's approval. Like, you know, he, he likes them. He's always nice to them. I'd love to see him start hammering ESPN. That'd be phenomenal. I would yeah, lo- and Notre Dame fans would fall in love with Brian Kelly all over again if yep. he started doing that. Yep. And so that's why sometimes I wish if Brian, if I was ever to get hired by hired at Notre Dame, it would be as Brian Kelly's PR guy. <laughs> like where I'm like, hey, coach, here's what you need to do. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's so many just, if I wish he would just do these things differently, people would love him. That would be a job that I would, <laughs> I would probably maybe consider. Uh, but any, anyway, I'm joking, obviously. <laughs> but so he, here, here's the point about this, though. If you want to be given a fair shake, ultimately, then earn it. Mm-hmm. Earn it. Because what you're saying, Daniel, is, well, Notre Dame's no different than Michigan State or Washington or any other team that's not those teams. Okay? If you want to a fair shake, then earn it. Beat Bama, beat Clemson, beat Ohio State. Stop making stop buying the brian kelly excuse of well nobody because what you're telling me is exactly what brian kelly said after the season last year and it i despise it then and i despise it now you're freaking notre dame right could you imagine lou holtz well you know nobody beats miami no he didn't say that he said you know what we're gonna beat miami we're gonna beat florida state we're gonna beat florida right and that's how it should be and I'm not going to buy that. And, and t- if you want to be respected, then beat those teams. But even then, I'm just preparing you. Even then, there will be disrespect and all those type of things. For it will be excuses made for those teams, and there will not be the same respect for Notre Dame. That's just the, how it's going to be. Joe uh, has a super chat followed by Ricky, I do believe. If you want to grab those real quick. I can. Thank you. You're starting to recognize the avatars, aren't you? I am. <laughs> Getting lucky. Uh, Joe, thank you for your super chat. He says, some ND players seem to take pleasure in chirping. If they'd all been mic'd up and you could go back and hear, speculate who'd be the most entertaining. It's got to oh, be Kyron, God. right? Yes, that was exactly. Yes. I mean, <laughs> Kyron and Jason Adamiola would be the two Ooh. guys I'd like to see mic'd up during a the game. There you go. And, and But here's the problem. You couldn't play it. <laughs> No, nope. never play it. It has to just be us listening because, like, ooh, yeah, beep, 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 beep. You know, like, let's get rid of that, Mama Joe. It's just Mom, like I'm be totally, sitting totally in the NFL I'm Films totally truck while oh. it's not going out and just like listening. That'd be great. I'm joking about the cursing thing. No, those are the two kids that they because they it both happens. play with a lot of swagger. Yeah, and they both just nonstop just talk, and I love it. I, <laughs> I've said this before. This is an area where me and my dad disagree. I like players that talk when it's talking the right way. I, what I hate are guys that like have a three yard gain or tackle a right. guy for a four yard gain and it's like, dude, up. yeah, it's like, dude, you didn't do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. you lie to dude up, you talk. But like, just Kyron's just, but that's just how Kyron is. That's how Jason is. It's just, it's part of their game. You know who I think it's got to be part of who, part of your game. You know who I'd like to hear is Michael Mayer. I don't know that he'd come up with anything inventive, but I have a feeling he says something like. I, I don't know if I don't know if I really notice him talking a whole lot. Like, you know what I mean? Like he just seems like a dude that's just kind of like it'd be like real short and like Yeah, that's it, it, that it would be. But yeah. like I want to know what he's saying cuz I know he's saying something. Yeah. You know. I don't know. But I don't know. anyway. Okay. I don't know. 
We got another one down there, I do believe. Richard from Maltby. Ricky, thank you very much. He says, nobody, and I mean nobody, wants to play us right now. It's just a matter of time until we get that natty, my friends. I hope you're right. Me too. And and look, I true look, here's the thing that a lot of some of y'all may not recognize about me, and I've said it before, but I'm gonna reemphasize it. I believe Brian Kelly is capable of leading Notre Dame to the national championship. And there's really just a couple things that he's finally got to get over before he does that. But I I do believe he's capable of it. I don't think they need to fire Brian Kelly or let him retire or whatever to win a title. I think he's capable of it. But is he going to do the things he needs to do? Has he surrounded himself with enough people that are going to tell him the hard decisions he's got to make? I don't know if Tommy Reese, as much as I like what Tommy Reese is doing, I don't know if Tommy Reese has got the the thought or the, the willingness or even the 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 opinion that he needs to walk into Brian Kelly's office and say, we got to make two big changes this offseason coach. That's just between us taking that next step. Right. Uh, I don't know if Marcus Freeman or Mike Elston or anybody or Brian Polian are willing to do that. I don't know. I know Brian Polian's not. I don't think Brian Polian is. But that's the big thing is hey coach, we're close, man, but we've got to make some changes. We've got there's just a couple changes we got to tweak. And I mean if you if you look at almost outside of Bama Almost every time Ohio State, Clemson, all these teams have kind of taken that next step, it came after some sort of coaching change in their staff. Sometimes it was getting rid of a guy. Sometimes it was, you know, Chad Morris leaving Clemson to become a head coach, and they promoted Jeff Scott and Tony Elliott. But, like, you look at Ohio State, it was getting rid of Everett Withers and and bringing in Tom Herman as the offensive coordinator and bringing in Chris Ash as the defensive coordinator. You know, at, at, at LSU, it was going out and getting Joe Brady and, and making those changes right. with the staff. You know, I mean, it, it's 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 a lot of these big jumps have been a result of coaches being willing to make those changes. You know, it, it, look at Ohio State and the juggernaut they've become now, right? They have won a title, but it was after the 2016 season when they had just gotten embarrassed in the playoff, 31 nothing, and he said, you know what? No. And he got rid of Tom uh, – oh, gosh, I'm uh, – drawing a blank now on, on the name's coach, but then Ed Warner and he went out and brought in Ryan day. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that you need to do. It's it's look, yeah, we're really good, but we're not there yet. And that means we can't just coach a little harder or coach a little better and play a little harder, right. which has kind of always been Brian Kelly's mantra after a good season. Yeah. If you don't win a championship, you need to be willing to say, is there things we can do better and have an honest conversation? Are there play things we can do better? Some of it's on me as a coach. I got to, you know, maybe we should have planned our off season a little differently or, you know, handle this a little differently or whatever. And that's every coach should be that way. And sometimes it's like, we're not getting enough from that position group and we got to make a change. And that, 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 but I don't think he's, he spends so much time making excuses for those position groups. that I think he's kind of convinced himself that those position groups are good yeah. enough. And that's my concern. I think we have, a, we have one Just more down say, here. Do we have one more down there? I, <laughs> no, we're good. Okay, good. Uh, Tommy Guns uh, has one up here. He says, Brian, do you remember who the, quote, hot new coaches were if Brian Kelly had been let go after 2016? Any thoughts as to who might have been the one to replace him? I honestly don't remember. I, I don't really either. Don't. I don't remember having the conversation because it was it felt like it was really fast that they doubled down on Brian Kelly. Like, I I don't remember there being a big period where... Yeah, I remember Vince being in Texas in January for the Army game. Okay. Doing, like, con trying to connect with Chip Long and the new hires. Because it was okay. like, I mean, by January, they had already said we're, we're, we're hiring new coaches. There was not really a long period. I know we discussed it during the season of who would replace them, but it's always like Urban Meyer and... You know, I don't I don't know if it ever got there where they were legitimately the hot names. I, I really don't. I know like I think like there there was like I think the only one I remember is like the guy that was at Colorado, Mike McIntyre. Remember him? Yeah. They had Colorado just had a really good year in 2016, I believe it was. And you know, he's I don't even know where he's coaching now. He's not a head coach anywhere that I that I know of. So I, I but other than that, I really don't I really don't know. All right. Uh, Roderick Blackman says, Hey guys, love the show. Just wanted to ask if you guys think this current team is ready to get Notre Dame's first playoff victory or perhaps even a championship. It's possible. I, look, I, I think this team's a lot better than, than a lot of people do. And I felt it during the off season and I feel it this, I feel it now. And I don't even think they've hit their peak yet. I really don't. I think that 
if you can keep this defense playing the way it's playing in the postseason and then add Kyle Hamilton to it, boy, that's a dangerous defense. If if you know the the offense can be as creative, like my big fear is they go into the semifinal and they kind of go back to what they were. You know, if you go into the semifinal and you're like, hey, look, we got nothing to lose, man. Like I, that's what I'm hoping that Brian Kelly has the mindset of. I, I kind of feel like the last two times Notre Dame went into the playoff, the matchup or the perception is kind of like Notre Dame, they were undefeated and there was this pressure on them. Like now it's like you you got it. And they were like, they had to fight to keep their playoff spot. You know, they were always in the top four. This would be something completely new for them, which is like even in 2012, it was like you were there. You just kind of, you know, now it's like, man, we, we, we weren't a top four team till the very end. Yeah. And and you, I think you go in with a different mindset in those situations, and and play looser and more free because nobody thinks you can beat Georgia. Nobody thinks oh, you can beat no. Georgia, right? No, or know. or if Ohio State or Bama's number one, because like, I think if Bama beats Georgia, I think Bama leaps Ohio State becomes number one. That's what I think. So nobody thinks you're going to beat Bama. Nobody thinks you beat Georgia. Nobody thinks you, so so hey, you know what? Go have some fun with it, right? They think right. you're going to get killed anyway. So have some fun. Let's come up with some stuff. Let's. You know, there's no pressure on you. I mean, literally, Notre Dame would have the least amount of pressure of any. Like, I agree. I'd have the group of five pressure. Oh, you know, group of five, you got to represent, blah, blah, blah. If you don't play well, we're never going to have another group of five team in the playoff, right? I don't believe that, but that's going to be the Until two mantra. years from now when they expand it. So, right. You know. but, but, well, that, <laughs> right. you know what I'm saying. Yeah, but, uh, but there would be no pressure on Notre Dame because, yeah. oh, they're going to get killed in the first round. Of course they are. Right. You know? So have some fun with it. But I, I well, think this team material. is, is, is fresh. Because again, you're playing a lot of guys now that you weren't playing early in the year. A whole yeah, absolutely. lot. Absolutely. You know, you you've had some guys miss games. Kurt Heinisch missed some games. I think you know that kind of it, it hurt you then, but it's taken some of the wear and tear off of him a little bit. You know, sure. You've got such a deep rotation on the defensive line. This is as fresh of a defense. I mean, Notre Dame's defensive line usually is wearing down in November, not this year, because Mike Elson from day one mm-hmm. said we're going to use a rotation, and he stuck with it much more than he has in the past. And and I just think this team is is peaking. I really do. And there's still a there's still a, a, a level that they can get to, I believe. And I feel like after the regular season's over, if they get in the playoff, they're gonna be able to go back and self-scout the last six weeks, seven weeks, and say, okay, yeah, this stuff really worked, but there's some more things we can add. And I think Notre Dame is gonna look a lot different. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I think this is – no, I'm not saying they're going to win it. Yeah. But I think this team, to me – the other team, I thought the 2018 team was poised to win. They got a bad draw. That Clemson team was phenomenal. And they played Clemson much tougher than the final score. And then last year, their first round – I mean, that's the thing is people's all, oh, you know, Notre Dame gets blown. They got they lost to the champ both times, right? So it's not like it's, – it's not like – you know, Florida State getting killed by Oregon, who then got crushed by Ohio State, right? Like, right. You got crushed by the team that crushed the next team, right? Because yeah. that's the thing is now, and again, I don't buy that whole you use that to pump yourself up, but it's just an example of, of course, they're going to treat Notre Dame differently than they treat Ohio State, who got blown out by Bama last year and also got beat in the playoff one year 31 to nothing, right? Right. You know, in 2016. Well, they don't talk about that because Ohio State's won games. I think this team's capable of it. I, I really do. Interesting hypothetical here from Johnny Jimenez. He says, hypothetical, Cone knocked out of a playoff game against Ohio State. Pine is already in the transfer portal. What are you doing at half to scheme a win with Tyler Buckner? I mean, that's just – I don't even really want to get into that hypothetical because there's no way Drew Pine is in the transfer portal before the <laughs> season's over. Right. Like, even if Drew Pine left, he's not leaving to left the season. That's not the kind of kid Drew Pine is. I'd right. be shocked if that happened. Well, I'd also shocked. be shocked if he left at the end of the season too. But right. Well, that's, that's what, what I'm saying. Like, well, I mean, I, there's no way right. he's going to be in the portal until after the season. If he, even if he was going to transfer, right. That's what's what I'm saying. Now let's say Drew Pine's injured. Okay. Then I'll accept that. I, you know, let's say he rolls his ankle up and he can't play the week before the, the playoff game. Okay. We'll work with that. What are you doing at halftime to scheme a win with Tyler Buckner? You're gonna design. You're gonna change your completely change your run game. You're gonna start emphasizing the things he does. Power reads. I'm running jets. I'm throwing downfield shots. I'm moving the pocket. I'm getting him out of the pocket. I'm running more empty stuff, and I'm gonna come out this third quarter, and I'm gonna have three plays that I know he flat out can read and execute, and I'm getting him easy completions, and then I'm having him take a shot. That first series, I'm coming out throwing 
that first series of the third quarter. And I'm throwing stuff that he's comfortable with. I'm taking a shot down the field because that's what they did against Virginia Tech. I think his first series, he took a – was it like third play or so, something like that? He, they throw a bomb to Kevin Austin, right? That was a great call by Tom Reese. He said, got him comfortable. Hey, look, yeah. man, you're okay. You got this. And then and then that's what I would do. And then I would move the pocket, and I would uh, you know do some things where you move him around. I think that's kind of that's kind of what it takes. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, yeah, I, I, I got to pull this up. This is a this is a great comment right here. Just give me a second. <laughs> Read that, Vince. <laughs> Uh, UIW Swimmer says, I'm just trying to think of a bad take to post to get BD fired up again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it would take a whole lot. So, uh, hey, be nice. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Vince has yard work to do. <laughs> <laughs> I love when you get fired up because I just sit back and I'm just like, ooh, okay, here we go. This is good stuff. Yeah, that's my favorite. Oh, that's great. That's great. Okay, Tommy has one. He says, if everybody who's eligible returns, who's on the preseason awards watch list for next season? Uh, Kyle Hamilton (laughs) would be the first one. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's see. Pretty Pretty much everybody by position. Kyron Williams, Michael Mayer. Everybody's eligible to come back except for Kane Madden and and Cone, right? Well, you basically – I mean, let's let's not include 60-year seniors, right? Let's just – so let's go. Let's go because it wouldn't matter anyway. Because they're not going to. Josh Lugg's not going to be on an awards list. No. Uh, but Kurt Heinisch can't come back. Well, okay. I yep. Don't think Myron Tungavalo Amosa can come back. I don't okay. think. Drew White. I don't think can come back. Maybe. I. I don't know. Uh, Kyron Williams, Michael Mayer, Isaiah yep. Foskey, yep. Jason Adamiola, Kyle Hamilton. It would be the guys in the preseason award watch list. Yes. Anybody Agreed. that I'm missing. I don't think Cam Hart would be, although I, I would, think he will I be would consider it. But yeah, I would that's that would be my prediction. I, I can't think of anybody on the offensive side. Maybe Kevin Austin on the yeah, watch that, list that have like 50, 60 people on it. He would be right. On it, yes. Right. That's Kevin Austin was, would be on it. Yeah. That was the one that was the one I had in my mind. Because those watch through. lists are like 60 dudes. Oh, oh, and Jared Patterson, of course. Sorry. Yes. Jared Patterson, definitely. Yeah, Definitely. good point. And good honestly, point. it wouldn't shock me if Joe Walt was on some preseason watch lists. Hmm. That's because he's like on the freshman All American thing and and all that kind of stuff. It wouldn't shock me if Joe Walt was on some of those. Okay, I wouldn't put him on necessarily because you know he needs to prove that he's going to start next he's year. He's got a ways to go. I mean, right? But yeah, he's a guy that I would consider. But the, yeah, those are those would be the guys to me, Vince. That that would be on there. I mean, Kevin Austin, the way he's finished the year, you know, as long as he has a decent game against. Uh, you know, yeah, I think he'll be on it. He'll be on it. Yeah. Again, watch right. lists have like 50, 60 guys yeah. on it, right? Yeah, so he, so would, he would be on yeah. it. Yeah, he'd be on it. D Rock says, I've heard that BK will stay out west after the Stanford game for a week on the recruiting trail. Perhaps he'll have a conversation with CJ Williams. The whole they, point, he always does that. They yeah, always do that. That's something they do all the time. The whole point of them ending the season in yeah. California so they can all stay out there and recruit the yeah. West Coast. So, yeah, I would imagine that, 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 I would be so shocked, and I don't know this for a fact. I'd be really surprised if Tommy and and Kelly aren't both out there to see him. And then, of course, they'll have in home visits that they can do with CJ as well. That I would imagine, but yeah, I would I would imagine that's going to be a major priority for Brian Kelly is keeping him and Junior Two on Mock and Tobias Merriweather happy. Tobias is so I probably shouldn't have brought him up because then people are going to take it the wrong way. But like, I'm just thinking of the West Coast kids, not necessarily the guys in our. That are are waver, waving wavering a little bit. Uh, Zachary Ryan, I wanted to bring this one up. Uh, am I just being selective in my memory, or will the next time a wide receiver runs a post be the first time a wide receiver runs a post? Uh, you forgetting Avery Davis against Clemson? Well, uh, Avery that, Davis against Purdue. Yeah, I mean <laughs> that was Avery Davis's best route, you know, for right. big plays. No, they um, they run a lot of post routes. They just don't throw a ton of post routes. Uh, but yeah, Avery Davis had one. Uh, he's thrown a couple to Braden Lindsay. There was a was it the they threw one. Um, I thought they threw one against Georgia Tech. They threw one recently. Maybe it was USC or I mean North Carolina. But yeah, they they've thrown they throw post routes mm-hmm. and they run a lot of post routes. It's just they don't get to those because teams right. will play it and they'll throw it underneath. But yeah, the touchdown pass to Purdue. He threw it. He definitely threw a post route to Braden Lindsay. He missed a post route to Braden Lindsay against Wisconsin. Remember he the missed one he one, overthrew early. Yeah, he missed one to uh, Colsey. Wasn't that a post route? That one. No, he hit. Con- he hit Colsey. He hit Colsey. That's what it was. Yeah. Okay. That yeah. was a post route. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. against Navy. 
So yeah, it was okay. recently. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, he missed a go route in the corner to Colsey. Well, there he didn't it miss that... it. It was it was thrown well. It just covered really well. Yeah, there you go. But yeah, he there threw a, he threw a, and hit a post route to okay. Dion Colsey. So there yeah. you go. We got a super chat at the bottom here. And be... Zach's defense. It's hard to see that on camera. I mean, it on is. the TV. Copy. That's a good point. That's a really yeah. good point. Yeah. Ian Ian has a uh, super chat at the bottom. If you want to grab that one real quick, I can do that. It'll be yes. a pretty quick answer. I have a feeling. Uh, thank you, Ian, for the super chat. He says, what are the chances Kyle Hamilton returns? Um, scale of 1 to 10, minus 74. Right. There's <laughs> there's no chance. No. <laughs> the only way that Kyle Hamilton returns is if the NFL says, hey, we're not having a 2022 season. <laughs> and we're canceling the draft. Yeah, we're just not going to have football for all we're not have football next year. This is not, we've canceled the draft. We're just yeah. not going to draft anybody this year. Yeah. Um, he's he, Look, he's, a, he's depending on who you look at, you know, on, on the big board, right? He's like number three, number four, like top five, top ten. Now, that's not necessarily the order he's going to go in because it, it goes by right. need. Most but... people on the board have him in the top five. Yes, exactly. Mock drafts are usually him in the top ten. Look, there's look, right. there's no reason for Kyle Hamilton to come back. No. I mean, no. The, he can't improve his stock anymore. And if anything, the injury situation only enhances his – the odds he leaves there's just there's nothing he can prove in my opinion i mean if i was advising him i would tell him after after the season go pro yeah yes i wouldn't have advised him to not play the rest of this season because my understanding from multiple sources is this was not in any way a season ending injury brian kelly has done a good job protecting kyle hamilton from in that regards right. from taking those kind of you know public hits but yes he is he was he could have come back and he made a business decision not to come back. Mm-hmm. I don't like it, but that's who advised him. But yep. uh, as but as far as the next decision to leave, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, dude, you gotta go. Right, and, and we're gonna do a show next week. Just so everybody knows, one of the shows Vince and I talked about this was it Wednesday we talked about this, Vince. We're going to have a show next week that's going to be a should he stay or should he go? Yeah, Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah. yeah type of show so we'll, yep. we'll, we'll get into all that of who should come back who should leave who we're hearing is going to come back who we're hearing is going to leave uh, but more stuff. so a lot of it's going to be our opinion on who should or should yes. come back but we will share some of the things that we're hearing at that point yep. in time as well d rock's got a question he says uh thoughts or updates on our punter jay bramlett and leaving at the end of this year as a grad transfer yeah we talked about this the other day d rock um i anticipate him him leaving by the end of the year and no he was not forced out he was not forced out because they got the new punter. They went after the new punter because they were going to lose. Jay. Jay has two years of eligibility left. And so, because remember, his first year, uh, he, last year didn't count. He played as a freshman in 2019, so he didn't redshirt. But 2020 doesn't count because of COVID. So technically, he's a redshirt sophomore, even though he's punted for three years because of COVID. So he still has two years left to punt. So he's going to uh, leave after his junior year? Correct. Wow. To go to transfer somewhere else. Oh wow, I didn't realize that. Okay, mm-hmm. interesting. Was there? Did you give reasons as to why? Because now I'm in the question asking mode. We can okay. discuss it afterwards. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Let's just say he, people asking, he just he would rather be somewhere else right now. That's and that's he's going to have his Notre Dame degree, and he'd rather be somewhere else. And I won't even get into the reasons why. And you know what? I'm totally fine. You know, that's his decision. Mm-hmm. Nicholas Grosh says, Vincent Bryan, your thoughts about poor behavior of fans was right on the money. You guys, however, have always been civil and respectful. So thank you. I appreciate that. We do try, believe me. And there are times where I feel like I'm not being that way. So I, I appreciate that. Because I do try very hard to do that. Because I try Except to put myself in my shoes. Madden. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody has their weakness. <laughs> Vince loses a little bit of a civility. Everybody has their weakness. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, here's a question while you're looking, Thank Vince. You. Searcher Green has a good question. I wonder if any, any, any NFL owners have second thoughts on guys who quit on their teams during the season. No, they don't. They don't care. They don't. Uh, matter of fact, I think if they had a, if they had their way, they'd probably advise some of it. You know, so I don't think they care. I think the only reason they would care is if it was done in a bad, disrespectful manner. Right. Yeah. And Kyle, like if Kyle, so let's just say this, let's say 
after the Virginia Tech win, Kyle Hamilton just said, I'm done. I'm not playing anymore. Right. I don't think that would be viewed all that well, but I don't think it would affect his draft stock much, if at all. When it happened the way it happened, where he had a legitimate injury, yes, he could have come back from it, but he chose not to. I don't think NFL teams care about that one bit. No. If anything, it's like, okay, good. Don't expose yourself to getting hurt again because we don't give a crap about – you know, they've already seen him play against Bama. They've already seen him play twice against Clemson. Yeah. Like they don't there's nothing else Kyle Hamilton has to prove Good from point. an NFL draft standpoint other than pass your medicals. That's it. Yeah. And and I do think they'd like to see him run because I do think there are some questions about just how fast is he really. Mm-hmm. But I I mean he he no one's gonna care about that. I I think there are some positions where people might care more. I think quarterback is one where they might care more. But a safety like Kyle Hamilton, they're just like, dude, just don't get hurt. Yeah. The teams in the top ten are like, oh god, please don't get hurt, please don't get hurt, please don't get hurt. Right. We, don't, we don't need. It's nothing else we need to learn about you. It's going to be hard seeing him on one of those teams that are terrible in the NFL. Mm-hmm. But that's another conversation. All right, Justin Olson has a question. I understand the possible legalities behind why this can't happen, but how great would a live stream game call with Vince and Coach during an actual Notre Dame game be? So I don't know if we'll ever get to the point, at least not in the near future, where we would do that for a Notre Dame game. This is why I, I, am, up. I am trying to uh, get more information on it, but there is a chance that we may be doing something with our podcasting company where we might be doing streams of other games where we're talking while watching the game and you can see the game. And I don't want to get too much into it because I'm still learning about right. what exactly it would look like and if we're going to commit to it or not. But that offer is thrown out to us. It's intriguing. It's very intriguing. But it would be hard to do for a Notre Dame game because there's so much other work I have to do. Right. Publishing stories and proofing stories and all that. It would be a little hard. But maybe down the road, if our staff grows enough and, you know, I can just be more of a sort of just (laughs) a CEO. Yeah. I mean, that that, would be something I would do. That's what it is, right? That's eventually what I'd like to get to where I can then do that stuff. You know, hey, you're writing the stories, you're doing this, and then. You know, Vince and I are doing this. Yeah, right. Absolutely. But we're not there yet. That would be fun. We just got a super chat in from Daniel. If you want, there it is. Daniel Wade. He says, Thank you to all mm-hmm. the Notre Dame family for raising that dough for those who need it. Awesome. Yeah. No and we've spent about, about 35% of it now. I've talked to several donors that are okay with us using some of that for Christmas. There are a couple other things that we committed to financially that that are that are we'll take care of like Monday and Tuesday. But yeah, we uh we appreciate that, but we're gonna oh, yeah. we're gonna be able to put a lot of that, a lot of that towards Christmas as well. I mean, I I can't believe we only spent thirty five. I, <laughs> I mean, I literally like was at the store the other day and just like just God put on my heart like, hey, pay for this lady's groceries. Just some random lady, just like in her pregnant daughter, just said, hey, we got your oh, groceries, wow. right? Like, and still, you know, 30%. <laughs> yeah, thirty percent, thirty five percent, yeah, yeah. John Rodden asked this question too while we're down here. Any news oh, on cool. Blake Fisher's health? Uh, I don't expect. From everything I've been told, I don't expect Blake Fisher back this year. I, I just, That's a shame. I, I haven't heard anything new about it. I, I just I don't expect him back this year. Yeah, I think the that goal stinks. is getting him healthy for next year. Now, oh, and it should be. That, could that change as they kind of get through the season and they test the knee out and maybe he gets a couple workouts and practices in and they're like, hey, he's looking pretty good. Maybe they play him in the bowl game. Maybe, but I don't. I just don't. Especially if they don't make the playoff. If they don't make the playoff, there's really no reason to bring him back. Just get him Agreed. healthy for the winter and get him healthy, yeah. healthy for spring ball, and he'll be fine. Because Blake's already proven he's a quick study. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I'd be fine with that. John Rich has an interesting one here. He says, you're the AD at a major college. What are the first three questions you ask a head coaching candidate? I've never been in a head coaching interview before with an mm-hmm. AD for a college. So... That is a very interesting question. I would wonder what that mm-hmm. would be. My, I would love to be the fly on a wall in one of these interviews. That is for sure. Mm-hmm. You know. Yep. So my first one would be, what are your priorities? If I would, I would want to, I would want to not be leading at all with this. My first question would be, what are your priorities as a head coach? I want to hear his answer, and I want to be able to read his body language as he answers this. And if a guy starts talking about, like, immediately starts talking about national championships and blah 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 blah. That is cool, but it's going to tell that me something because I'm, I'm a big believer in I I don't like what the coaching profession has become. Just going to be honest with you, especially at the mainly at that level. But it bleeds down, Vince. You know, this bleeds down all through it. 
I believe winning is important. I, I believe you should never play a sport if your objective at the end of the day is to have more points than the other team. But I believe that winning is a byproduct of running your program in a way where you're developing young people. And we'll still go football, so we'll say young men uh, from a, a, a mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical manner where you care, where you're as invested in what kind of people you're creating as what kind of football players you're creating. And I wish more coaches cared about that. And they don't. They care about, are you eligible and can you help us win? And when you stop being those two things beyond that, I don't really care. You know, now not all coaches are that way, but there's too many that are that way where they really don't, they, 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 you know, like when, when, Hey, our star running backs, not going to class and not doing the right thing, but we're going, we're going to make it work. We're going to get them to people to write papers for him. You're, what are you teaching him? If you're good at, if you have an athletic talent, you can, you, you're different. You know, you, you don't have to be responsible or accountable. I think those are horrible life lessons. It helps your football team, but doesn't help that young man. And I think there's too much of that. And if I'm an AD and I'm making it a higher, then I care about what kind of young people you're developing. Because yeah. I said this when I was a coach, and I believe it to this day. I said, look, I am. I have always felt, and I've said this to my players, in 20 years, we're going to do our reunion. We're going to talk about the championships we won and the football stuff. But what I'm going to care more about as your coach, I'm going to care more about what kind of husband you are what kind of father you are, what kind of employer you are, what kind of employee you are, and what kind of impact you're making in your community. I care a whole lot more about that than when you were a great football player at the age of 20. Because if you're a D-bag as a 40-year-old, I don't care how good of a football player you were when you are 20. Right. And, and, and I believe that. Now, however, I also won a lot as a position coach, and we set records at positions I coach. I mean – my first full-time job as a running back. I coached an All-American that year. We had our, our, the school's first playoff, uh, first 10-win season in school history, first playoff appearance in school history, first uh, playoff victory in school history. The next place I went to, I was a pass game coordinator. We broke and then rebroke all the school's passing records before. Uh, you know, then at Duquesne, we won a national championship when I was there. So, like, yes, we won, but – the regrets I have as a coach are the times where I maybe didn't invest enough in the young men as people as I did in football. And, and, but the memories that I have are still the best memories I have are, are investing in people. We had someone who, who um, I tell you, this matters more to me than a kid that I was a coach at a school where we had great success. One of, you know, went, got to the postseason and one of our kids shared us. And I don't even remember this, but he shared a story with me about how, he was really struggling and I sat down with him at lunch one day and just encouraged him and talked to him and just showed that I cared. I don't even remember the conversation. I truly don't remember the conversation. And he was like, that meant more to me than anything. And he ended up staying on the, you know, the academic course and now he's a doctor. Right. And I mean, it's just like, wow, like, I don't even remember that, but like that, I got more joy out of that than man, you know, you taught me how to run a post route better than anybody's ever taught me how to run a post route, you know? So I'd want to learn those things. That would be at the beginning of it. And then after that is what is your hire? What is your philosophy on hiring coaches? And then what is your, you know, what kind of system do you plan to employ? And that matters to me too, because I want a coach that's going to tell me not just, well, we're going to run this scheme, but why, what kind of players can we recruit? What should, and then the last one would be what your recruiting philosophy would be, would be tied into that too. But those would probably be at the top of the questions that I would have for a new coach. There you go. Okay, Michael S. Oh, actually, we have, we a, have a super, uh, super chat, chat here. Yeah, please grab that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Hulk strongest. Love that, by the way. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Hulk, love the show. Listening all the way out here in Hawaii, which is awesome. Uh, but can you guys tell me why no one is talking about Chris Tyree's blocking of late and why he doesn't get more carries? You mean no one other than us? Because we definitely talked about that in the last show for sure. So um, I... I don't know. I, I think they're still they're still working him back from the turf toe, but yeah. I still don't think they were giving him enough touches in the first place. Right so, before the turf toe. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I can give the excuse of a turf toe, but I don't think that that's really the a legitimate. reason. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and just say he's still not a hundred percent, and they don't want to put a full workload on him. Sure. Sure. I'm going to give him the benefit of now that because we did see him work more against Georgia Tech. We did see in the first yeah. half he was getting past pro. They were working him more. And turf toe is one of those things that can linger and can seem fine, but it's not yeah. really. And you injured again. Yeah. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt on this one. And that it is that it is. 
And then again, here's the thing is if you do believe you're a playoff team, is it more important for you to have Chris Tyree healthy for Georgia Tech and Stanford or Georgia? Or, or whoever Ohio you're playing. Yeah, okay. exactly. I'm going to give them the benefit of doubt on this one. I am. But again, Vince, they weren't giving them enough touches before the injury, right. in my opinion. Yes. But that agreed. was a different offense. This offense is that much is more geared point. towards spreading point. the ball around yeah. than it was before. So, again, I, I want to give them a benefit out on this one. All right. Michael S. says, do you think that Fickle, I believe that's what that's going to be, needs mm-hmm. to get his next big-time college job at the end of this year since he's losing most of his top-line guys? If he stays, he's looking at a bad year. I, 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 when you've done a good job building a program, it doesn't mean when you lose players, you're going to suck the next year. I, I don't know why. I know that's what Brian Kelly has convinced everyone of, but that's not how it works when you're a good football team. Uh, yes, they're going to lose a lot of really good players, but they're not going to suck next year because they've recruited a lot of other really good players. And so, no, I do. Are they going to be as good next year as they are next year? No. Is it going to be a bad year next year? Absolutely not. They're still going to have a lot of good football players in their team, and they've done a great job recruiting at that level in recent seasons. So I also don't think that Luke Fickle just doesn't strike me as the kind of guy that is just looking to make jumps. And and here's how I know. Here's what makes me believe that. His name rarely gets mentioned as a serious candidate. And the reason why most of these coaches' names are getting mentioned, little inside baseball, it's because their agents are telling people, to He's not interested. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, or the other way around. Right. Yeah, exactly. They, exactly. Yeah. So if you yeah. don't hear a guy's name a lot, it's because he's not necessarily looking. Yep. That's why a lot of times you'll see – not a lot of times, but sometimes you'll see these, these coaches come out of nowhere when they make hires. Like, woman, well, I didn't even know that guy was interested. You didn't know that because you weren't actually doing your job. You were just going with what agents told you. Yeah. Were, because the agents were trying to – get this interest level so they could then get a get into a bidding or a contract thing with their you know the schools they're at i think luke fickle likes being at cincinnati and here's the other thing talking about a next big time college job cincinnati's going to be in the big 12 in three two years that's a good point so cincinnati is going to become a so big if he job. wants to hold out until they're in the big they, 12 yeah and yeah. they've made for as far as i understand again i could be wrong on this but they have made commitments to the football program that they're going to invest in it as part of that transition to the Big 12. So Cincinnati's going to become a good job here, a big-time job here real soon if it's not already. And, yeah. again, let's not forget Luke Fickle's an Ohio guy, mm-hmm. right? And I and I think that, that if he's something I, – And I think there's probably – there's there is a job that maybe he might want that he'd be better off staying and building Cincinnati into a power to get, and that's the job about an hour and a half northeast of where he is right now. That's fair. That's <laughs> That's fair. Uh, I do think he would take the Notre Dame job if they were interested. I do think that. Yeah. I. But that job's not available. Again, this is – guys, Luke Fickle doesn't have to leave Cincinnati to get a lot of money. (laughs) Right? I mean, that's the thing we have to understand. This isn't isn't 10, 20 years ago where you're making 400 grand at Cincinnati and you're making a a million and a half or two million at at Notre Dame or Ohio State. That's that's big difference in money. Now it's like two to four is not – I mean – you know, yes, it's still a big. It's actually a bigger gap than four hundred thousand to one and a half to two. But it's like, but once you have two, yeah, do you really need? You know what I mean? Like, exactly. I'm happy no. here. And more right. and more coaches are are voting on the latter part. I like it here. I'm comfortable here. I mm-hmm. got a good support system here. Mm-hmm. And they're seeing good coaches leave and fail, and then they're out of a job in three years and thinking. Why would I want to subject myself to that exactly. when I got a really good thing going here and I'm making two million dollars a year, a million and a half dollars a year? I mean, th- that especially for a guy like Luke Fickle, who strikes me as someone who cares more about the job than he does the paycheck. Yeah, paycheck is nice, but I'm not saying he doesn't care about yeah. the paycheck. But right. like, is it's it's like the only reason Luke Fickle would leave Cincinnati to go to Virginia Tech or to go to TCU or or LSU or is a paycheck? Yeah. For him, because of who he is, where he's from, and those type of things he values, right? It's not saying that those aren't better jobs. It's insane. That's not the point. It's about knowing Luke Fickle yeah, and what he values and the kind of person he is and the kind of family man he is and the fact that he's an Ohio guy. And Cincinnati's a good job, and it's turning sure. going to be an even better job when they join the Big 12 in a couple of years. No, no doubt about that. Uh, I w- want to give an update to Daniel, and I think maybe people did it in the chat, but he says, any idea when their score prediction video is coming out? Thanks, ND fam. We did it Wednesday night, uh, so it is available uh, if you go to the YouTube channel, obviously. Uh, mm-hmm. But it it is it is there. 
We did. I will actually put a link to it uh, in our in the chat here, so that way you have it. So you got the. I'll, I'll go ahead and put that in there. We got another super chat coming up here, Vince. Nice, nice, nice. Zach Martin, thank you, Zach. Appreciate it. it says extremely late to the show today, but what was your overall surprise level out of ten that Reese and Kelly made the offensive adjustments I be called for? Well, Zach, I can understand why you were late. You know, you're probably watching film from yesterday's game against the Raiders. <laughs> totally kidding. Uh, but uh, it's not that, Zach Martin. I'm just, I'm just having some fun. Uh, Nine, yeah, nine. It's high. Yeah, it's really I, I'm high. gonna have an article either later today or probably or tomorrow where I talk about that. I mean, actually, I might even wait till next week. That is that is one of the biggest surprises to me that of the Brian Kelly tenure. We have never seen in my that I can remember Brian Kelly makes uh, allow such a because again, let's be honest. This is Tom Reese of the OC. Brian Kelly. Brian Kelly admits every every week he mentions I'm he always. I'm in the room. I'm in the quarterback room. I'm in the quarterback room. I'm in the quarterback room. Me and Tommy talked. Me and Tommy talked, right? Um, I absolutely am shocked that they he allowed them to make that change instead of stubbornly just sticking to what they do because that's what they've always done. We're just going to stubbornly stick to what we do. Yeah. And it, it's another thing that gives me hope that Brian Kelly does, in fact, want to win a title. He does want to win. And, you know, there's things he does and says that frustrate the heck out of me. But again, we've seen more over the last year. We've seen more and more evidence that he is trying to make changes. This is another example, uh, Zach. And I think it's a great question. Surprise levels is, is nine. I mean, really, it, it eight nine. Vince, what would it be for you? Oh no, it'd be right up there because I we've we've seen the the pattern that we can only go off of what we've seen and and the pattern that we've seen offensively from Notre Dame with Brian Kelly at the helm has been what we saw in in the first half and I had no reason I had no reason whatsoever to think that that was going to change and the fact that it did was I, I was literally in my chair like huh like it was yeah. like it, it was it was shocking to me um and so I, I will say that I I was shocked and I I will say that uh, the comments that were made afterwards were a little head scratching as well uh but you know, we, we're seeing well, the it, flat, the fact that he flat out said we should have done this earlier. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Even more like, made him like, Whoa. Okay. Yeah. I was like, wow. other, usually Brian Kelly, when they do make, well, you know, we, we, we've been wanting to do this, but we weren't ready for it until now. Which yeah. You're like, makes no sense. Cause if you're yeah, really exactly. trying to build there, you'd have been doing something different. Right. <clears throat> but no, I, I, I and, and look, and that's also something they deserve a lot of credit for. Notre Dame would not be in the playoff conversation right now if they wouldn't have made those changes. And the reason I say that is they would probably still have won the rest of their games, but I don't think they would have been impressive. They would have won ugly. And I do think there's a chance they could have lost to, to North Carolina if that would have happened. Yeah. Uh, UIW Swimmer has a comment. Uh, we were talking about the, the the CJ Williams and going to, you know, blah, 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 blah. He says, uh, I have seen kids like Williams do this before. When I was recruited, even though I had verbally committed to my school, I took the other official visits anyway just for the experience. And that's fine if that's what he's actually doing. But the reality is most kids, when they take official visits this late in the process, it's because they are at least open to the idea of going somewhere Mm -hmm. else. And if he would have taken official visits in September or over the summer, that's fine. I but would the, encourage this is a little bit of a all five of their business. always unless wow. it's a like it, the only example the only exceptions are like Nolan Ziegler because like he was going to Notre Dame he's 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 comes from a Notre Dame family like literally grandparents you know yeah yeah that's true. been at Notre Dame there was never a doubt don't waste another school's time when you there's zero interest in those schools but if you kind of hey you know what I'm probably going to here but I'd at least like to check out another place I always whether they're official or unofficial go places because you're oh, going to yeah. all you're always going to have more certainty of the decision you make. I, I'll tell you what, it's one of the things that I'm looking forward to most with my kid mm-hmm. is, is taking those visits. Like, Hey man, let's get in the car. Let's take a weekend. Let's go to a bunch of schools. Let's, you know, that, that I'm fired up for that. You know, no matter what sport it is, no matter mm-hmm. what level it is, whatever. I think that sounds like a blast to me. Um, so I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to it. Here's what I'm going to pull up because I'm down here, Vince. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Tommy says, and this will give you some time to find some more. Tommy says, uh, BK did manage to keep Manti for an extra year. Not sure about the particulars in that situation and how they may or may not compare with Kyle, Kyle Hamilton. Manti wasn't a top pick. He wasn't a top 15 pick. He came back to try to become – I mean, if Manti would have been told after 2011 that you are a, a first-round pick and lock, he would have, he would have left. And he should have left. Right. Uh, you know, same. it's the same reason Zach Martin came back for a fifth year. It's the same reason Tyler Eifert returned for another year. It's to – Continue to drive up your your draft stock. <clears throat> Very rarely do kids turn down first round selections. Now Ronnie Stanley's one that 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 to me, he would from what I'm told, he was getting borderline first round talk, and Harry and BK were able to convince him, yes, you could be a late first round pick, but if you come back and play for another year, you can be a top ten pick. And you know because he was still he was still a true junior. And he's an offensive lineman where there's some positions where youth is considered a a negative. Yeah. And some positions where youth is coveted. Yeah. Youth for a quarterback is sometimes not coveted as much as it is for a running back. Running back was the one I was thinking. Or, uh, yeah. you know, offensive line, youth is not necessarily coveted. Yeah, because you want that fifth year guy with starting experience and like the and whole thing. Two more years in the strength yeah. program at college, yeah, absolutely, right? Yeah. And, and if so, it's a strength program that they that that NFL team right respects, right? I mean, I think that I think that is a big part of it, right? And the um, the other part yeah. of it too, Vince, is you can be thirty and lose a step as an offensive lineman and still be a really good offensive lineman because technique and savviness. You lose a step as a wide receiver at the age of thirty. Yep. You know, unless you're a Jerry Rice or a Marvin Harrison or a guy that's just an elite route runner, it's going to hurt you more than it. Right. You know, Tim Brown, those guys are the, those guys are rare. Those guys are the Hall of Fame exceptions to the rule. So that's another thing, too. The speed positions tend to they want to get you younger, you know, because technique's not as important. Grown man strength's not as important. The mental part of the game's not as important as it is for defensive linemen. Offensive linemen definitely to a degree linebacker and quarterback. So uh, th that's, but the biggest difference between those two is just yeah. um, draft positioning. Manti wasn't going to be a first round. Right. Drafter. Rob has a good question here, Brian and Vince. Is there one thing you're looking for tomorrow night from Notre Dame on both sides of the ball to know they are locked in to defeated or into defeating Stanford or into a defeated Stanford? Either way, things we're looking for. Well, see, Rob's trying to get me to give little giveaways of the articles that I'm going to write tomorrow. Ooh. I always do those what I'm looking for articles. Rob, but, you dirty uh, devil. Just look at him, man. I tell you what, Rob. Well, Rob, what I'm looking for really is I just want to see the energy level. I mean, on, like as far as like looking for early on, I want to see energy level. I want to see a lot of emotion. I want to see a lot of physicality. I want to see that, hey, we're ready to play. I want to see that they're treating this game like it is, which is an opportunity to make a statement. Not a cakewalk game where they suck and we aren't motivated and I'm still kind of got my turkey hangover and all that kind of stuff. I want to see this Notre Dame team come out with something to prove, hey, we're still getting disrespected. We're still getting all these clowns on ESPN talking about the oh, Big 12 is going to pass us up. We don't deserve a playoff spot. Forget y'all. We're going to show you that we are one of the best teams in the country. We are capable of being this, and that's an energy level. If they believe that and it's been it's been put into their minds as it should be by the coaching staff – then they're going to come out and they're going to be fired up and ready to play. And it's not going because again, it's not about Stanford. It's not about Stanford. Exactly. It's about Notre Dame. And to me, that's going to tell us that they're ready to beat Stanford. But it's also going to tell us a lot about this football team big picture as well. Which is why we held off doing that show on Notre Dame and and you know they're, them being a, a dangerous team. While we're going to wait till after this game to do it because I just want that final data point. My, I need my 12th data point. <laughs> you and your data points. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in the weeds here with uh, people that Notre Dame need to coach. Or, I mean, you know, need to have on the staff as I'm scrolling through. <laughs> so, apparently, Texas just beat uh, – beat, uh, uh, They, they did. just beat Kansas State. 22 to 17. Okay. So, I, I love these comments, the sarcasm that we are getting here. Texas is back. <laughs> love the sarcasm. Love the sarcasm Five of Shaman. Seven, Shaman. I love it. Love it. Five and Absolutely seven. Absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. D Rock is not even messing around. Horns down, baby. I'll do it. I got no problem doing it. 
<laughs> so yeah, no problem at all doing that. But yeah, it's a nice win for Texas, and and Nebraska's beaten uh, Iowa fourteen six at halftime. Are they really? Yeah. Wow. They were yep. favored by a point, and uh, my buddy they haven't lost a game by more than right. nine. Well, this my year. buddy it's goes, hey, why, why is Nebraska favored? I said, well, number one, it's at home. They're only favored mm-hmm. by a point, and I said they don't lose games by a bunch. And like, Iowa's not that good. Yeah, they're, they're not in that every good. game. That's why I stayed away from that game today. Let me tell you. Yep. Yeah. yeah. San Diego State's up on Boise 27-16 in the fourth quarter. Central's beating Eastern Michigan 24-10 in the fourth quarter. Bowling Green's looking to get their fourth win of the year over Ohio. Boy, that's been a bad, bad situation for Ohio. 18-10 in the fourth quarter. Utah State's beating New Mexico 28-0 in the third quarter. UTEP has beaten UAB 14-13 in the second quarter, and then Texas beat Kansas State 22-17. That's a tough loss for Kansas State. They needed that win to – I agree. To, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I totally agree. I I, I yeah. thought – because, you know, yes, it's a down Texas team, first-year head coach and everything, but if you're Kansas State, you beat Texas, that's still a big deal. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And they had a winning record, and, and a win against Texas, I think, would have gone a long way for them on the recruiting trail, you know, all of the above, because – I mean, I, I would venture to guess if I looked at Kansas State's roster, there's a bunch of guys from Texas uh, on mm-hmm. that roster. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You got some more? Uh, I am struggling to find okay. some stuff. I'm sure something's going to I'm going to work from the bottom up. Okay. You work that from the top good. down. William Herman says, is this the best recruiting staff that Brian Kelly has ever had in his time at Notre Dame? No, it's not. Uh, there were some staffs co- sort of like the – 12 and 13, 14, 15. Mike Dembrock was a heck of a recruiter. Tony Alford was a heck of a recruiter. Harry Heastan was an incredibly successful recruiter on offense. So the offensive staffs were definitely better back then, in my opinion. You had a great recruiter as your OC. You had a great recruiter as your running backs coach. You had a great recruiter as your offensive line coach. And tight end recruiting was just selling itself, essentially. Chuck Martin was a very good recruiter at Notre Dame. Kerry Cooks became a good recruiter at Notre Dame. You know, you got to think, I mean, as much as we love this defensive stat, this defensive recruiting class, and it's really good. And I would argue it, it's a, a D, another DB away from being the best defensive class of Brian Kelly's tenure, top to bottom. And that, that front seven class in 2011 was nasty. I mean, you had three five-star defensive ends in one yeah. class, Aaron Lynch, Ishak Williams, and Stephon Tewitt. Plus, you had Jarrett Grace. I've always felt Jarrett Grace without – and I'm not just saying this because I know Jarrett, he's been on the shows. I've said this my since he signed. Without the injuries, Jarrett Grace is a really good linebacker. I man. agree. And I would have loved to have seen a healthy Jarrett Grace next to Jalen Smith in 2015. That would have been a lot of fun to watch. No doubt. But – uh you know, you just you look at they had some really good re- individual recruiters. It's just the problem that they had back then is that there were some really good ones and then some really bad ones. Yeah, they were on the staff at the same time. Right? Yes, That's what I don't to. think yeah. I don't think that this staff has any really bad recruiters. Even Dell, he's not a really bad recruiter like some of the guys Kelly had early on. He's just not a Notre Dame guy. He's not a Notre Dame caliber. We're trying to win a championship guy. <clears throat> Jeff Quinn is not good enough as a recruiting offensive line coach, but he's a good recruiting offensive line coach. I just expect even better. But if he gets Billy Shrout, this is one of the best offensive line classes that Brian Kelly's yeah. had. I mean, it's just a fact. I mean, it you'd have it, it w- again, it wouldn't have the top level star power of some other classes, but you're never gonna find you will not be able to go back and, in my opinion, find another the only one you can maybe, maybe argue is the 2013 class that had Mike McGlinchey, Steve Elmer, Colin McGovern, John Montalus, and Hunter Biven. But I was never a big John Montalus fan. I did not like John Montalus as a player. I thought he was very overrated. You won't have, in my opinion, you won't have a fifth offensive lineman in any of those other classes as good as – pick who your fifth guy is. Is it Emil Wagner? Is yeah. it Ashton Craig? Is it Joey Tonona? I, I, who's the fifth guy in this class? Right, because it's not Billy Stroud. Billy Stroud's number one. Is it Ty Chan? Whoever it is, somebody has that guy ranked in the top one hundred and fifty. Like literally every one of Notre Dame's offensive yeah. linemen, except because I think on three has Ashton Craig in the top one hundred and fifty, or at least top two hundred. 
your fifth offensive lineman is going to be a top 200 caliber guy. And look, we liked Ashton Craig when he signed from an upside standpoint. Vince, I don't know if you've had a chance to see his senior film yet. It's impressive. Just his junior film. Yeah. It's his senior film is way but even better. And we liked him when he committed yeah. from an upside. Because what we said about Ashton Craig is he's just the kind of kid we say. It's like same with Joe Alt. You give me a kid like this as your fourth or fifth offensive lineman every exactly. year, and I'm fine. You I'm don't want him being your that. lead guy. No, you, but, but he's and a guy that, that fills was out the, the class. issue with the recruiting for so long. And yeah. now, and it's still the issue for me. That's why you need Billy Shrouth because Billy Shrouth becomes that top hundred guy. Absolutely. For, me. for yeah. me, I know that he's not ranked that high by others. I don't care. For me, he's a top hundred recruit. Sure. And and but you know, but again, can he be better? Yeah, he still needs to be better. Right? They missed out on some tackles they should have got. But it's still he's still good. Uh, Terry Joseph was a bad recruiter. I don't know about Chris O'Leary. That's the only one that I don't know about. I mean, because look, I've heard good things about him, but the reality is he's yet to get a commitment, and he's about to lose Ned Xavier to Wong, to Iowa. It's not a good start. But can he re- recover and get a Caleb Downs and a Peyton Bowen and some of those guys in the 2023 class? Then they'll say okay. He got in late, you know, he got started, didn't get hired till the 2022 class had already started. I get it. It is what it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe he doesn't want to follow in Kyle Hamilton's footsteps. Maybe, maybe that's it. I mean, you know, so but if I'm that's the give, case, if that's his mentality, and I'm not I, saying that it is right, but if that's I, his I, mentality, I don't know that I want to. I'm just it. saying my point was, yeah, and right, I agree with you, right, my point right, wasn't right. that that's true. My point right. was, Absolutely. I don't know why they're going to lose Xavier Nwong. I just right. know they're going to lose him. And yeah. as I learn more, it may just be like, you know what? Learn, lesson learned from for Coach O'Leary, and he's going to go out there and do a better job next year. Sure, I'm just not going to bang on him this one time because, again, this class he he got a late jump on this class, right? And you know, I mean, it's 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 a concern, but I'm going to give him another year to. I don't ever feel you should evaluate a coach who's a first time coach or a first time coordinator until his first full season. Yeah, that's the 2023 class for Chris O'Leary. Right, the full, so, first full season of recruiting. Yeah, right, exactly. where he gets on them as underclassmen, then he right. can see the whole thing through. It's the 2023 yeah, class. That's a good point. So if he has a great 2023 class, which is possible, I mean, you've got Caleb Downs has visited, Peyton Bowen's visited. You've had several top safeties on campus. Then, okay. And people have said, well, he also lost Sonny Styles. No, he was not recruiting Sonny Styles. Sonny Styles was being recruited to play linebacker for Notre Dame, Correct. not safety. Right. Even though he's listed by some services as a safety, I still don't understand that. No one's Ohio State's recruiting him to play that bullet position, which is basically like the rover. It's like a rover. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. Uh, Daniel Wade has a retort to your response uh, to his super chat. And so I want to be able to pull that up because we are, that's what we do, man. Okay. We allow these kinds of things. Daniel Wade says, incorrect. That was not my intention with my super chat. I was making a point that Notre Dame earned their way in, and other people outside of Notre Dame circles say, that we don't deserve a spot because of past years and results. If you earn your spot, then you freaking earned it. That's what I meant by national perception. That's I not what not, you said, though. I was I not mean, making an so, excuse. I don't roll that way. Right. That's fine. I respect that. But my point is, but that's not what you asked, though. Your question was asked in a way of basically when are they going to get respect? And nobody beats those teams except those teams. That's what you said. So this is a different deal. Yes, this is a different deal. They, and this is why I've said too that the what Notre Dame's done in past years in the playoff isn't going to affect whether the committee puts them in. I think that's something the committee for the most, except maybe Alabama, the committee does a pretty good job of what are you doing this year. That's why Clemson didn't jump in until last week. I mean, Clemson's first winning streak should have got them in the top 25 if they cared about what they did in the past. But they waited until they went out and actually beat somebody good before they finally jumped them in the top 25. And then when they did, it was like, what, 24? I mean, there's teams with three losses that are ranked a whole lot higher than Clemson. You know, I mean, look, there's a three-loss team in the top 15 right now in Wisconsin. But Clemson doesn't have it because this Clemson team is not that good. So, But I appreciate the retort, Daniel, but that's just not how um, I took your first question at all. But that, that one makes a lot more sense. But that's also why I would encourage you all not to get too worked up about what is said by people at ESPN. Other than just if we're going to do uh, what we what we've always done, which is make fun of them. Jake from State Farm uh, says, Brian, should we call up BYU for a game like Coastal Carolina did last year? They can't. It's illegal. I'm sorry. I just love the I just love the Jake from State Farm name. I just That's awesome. That. And That's the, awesome. especially the way that he 
what spelled it out there too. yes like, that's yes. great i had to read it like wait what? oh it's jake from state farm got it yes yeah the the thing that coastal and them did last year was to get they 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 weren't getting to 12 games they were under their number yeah right. exactly uh this is and, and i did, did they make they made an exception for that i'd have to go back and check on this but i thought there was an exception made for that i, I could be wrong on that but no notre dame can't schedule a 13th regular season game and i think jack swarbrick right. has talked about this in the past because he's been asked about this in the past, but it wouldn't matter. They they would not look. All the people from ESPN that are hyping up how good BYU has been the last two years would immediately change their tune if Notre Dame played them and beat them. Right, immediately would change their tune. And that's that's the reason I just don't care what what they say. Look, the committee. The, don't mind me. <laughs> is everything all right there, Vince? Apparently, uh, my phone was butt dialing nine one one. Okay, so awesome. there you I'm go. The, the cops are going to come busting through Vince's door here any second. That's going to be. We're going to get real exciting here yeah. on the live YouTube. <laughs> Freeze! <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> but 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 the thing the thing about it too is, I think that the I've said this to people that get worked up about what ESPN says, and and when I mean worked up, not like frustrated because I get worked up about what they say. But get worked up in that they take it as like, oh, gee, that's what's going to happen. Oh, the ESPN talking about the Big Twelve. Look, the committee has always shown that they don't care what ESPN says, right? And the the, the ESPN like it, just they love talking about the conference championships. Why? Because all the conference championships are hosted by ESPN or Disney Networks, okay? <laughs> uh, except for like what one, and it's like the the Mountain West or something like that's on CBS. No, I thought right? the Big Ten was on uh, Fox. Fox. No? Fox. Yeah. Yeah. But are they talking about the Big Ten right. Championship this year? No, they're no. not. <laughs> okay. No. So the, the point, point is, <laughs> the point is that that the committee has shown that, that the conference championships don't mean as much to them. That's why they didn't take Penn State over Ohio State. Even though Ohio State, so Penn State had two data points over Ohio State. They beat them head to head and they won the conference championship. Still took Ohio State. Right, Alabama in 2019. No, not 2019. They didn't get into 2019. What was the year Bama did not win their conference championship and still got in the playoff? Was it 2018? I'm trying to remember what year that was. <clears throat> it was 2017. 2017, the year that they won the championship. They didn't win their conference championship. Georgia played Auburn because Bama got beat by Auburn that year. And they were a four seed. By, right? by 12. Yeah. That was the year that I think Bama be, or Auburn beat them twenty four to was it a twenty four to fourteen or twenty four to twelve? Let me look that up real quick. Twenty six to fourteen was the final score of that game. So Bama loses the last game of the year, doesn't win the doesn't play in the Big Twelve Championship or SEC Championship, and still made the playoff and and went and won the championship that year. Right. So they they just don't care. Right, I mean, exactly. They don't care about that. They they're they're going to do the four best teams with a combination of eye test, resume, yeah. data points, and all that. And they're not going to put the conference championship like way up ahead of all the others, like ESPN does. Right. That's so the only person to ESPN whose opinion I ever ever even remotely pay attention to when they talk about the playoff and who's going to be there is Heather Dinich. That's the only one. She comes at it from an analytical standpoint. Well, and like, she also talks to the committee and she looks at what <laughs> they look at. That's a good point. That's called good journalism, yeah. right? How dare um, you? But How uh, dare you? she's, but it, 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 I mean, she and she's always going to have wrong opinions. Like we're going to have wrong opinions on what we think they're going to do. Because at the end of the day, it's still you Humans. know human beings making those decisions. But she at least tries to apply the committee's criteria. Right. And so she softened on some of the conference championship stuff. I don't know about this year because I haven't read as much of her stuff, but like in past years, she did she didn't take as hard of a conference championship stance. It was important, and it is important. It's just not the end all be all that he has the other people at ESPN make it out to be, which right. is why she's had better takes on yeah. the playoff than and she was I I, the, I haven't seen a text from her or a tweet from her in a few weeks because I I don't know if I follow her on Twitter or not. I don't see much of her tweets, so I don't think I do. But she had something like three, four weeks ago talking about people better not sleep on Notre Dame being a legitimate contender. As all the other everyone else, the ESPN was like, "No, shut up!" They, you know, right? But like she's been talking about Notre Dame for a little bit now because she understands what the committee actually looks at, and she, you know, has common sense and does her, her job. It's good on her. Yeah, different. You know, whatever. Yep. Okay. 
We got one right here. UIW Swimmer. I have a weird opinion that this Irish team could beat Georgia, but I don't know if we could beat Ohio State. Which team do you think we match up better with for a round one draw? I have said this for a couple weeks now, I believe. I, Georgia does not scare me as much as Ohio. It can scare me just, okay, Georgia's not as bad. Georgia's a better matchup for Notre Dame than Ohio State is, in my opinion. I just, I, I, I don't know if Notre Dame can go into the playoff and win a shootout. I don't, I don't know if I have enough confidence in that yet. But I think Notre Dame can score enough to beat Georgia. I, I do. I, look, I think Georgia's a very good team. And if I was a betting man and I had to bet on the game, I'd probably pick Georgia to win. But I think Notre Dame can flat out beat Georgia. And if by the time we get down to where it's prediction time, if that's a matchup, I'd probably be able to convince myself that Notre Dame is the team I'm going to make to predict, is going to predict a win. Ohio State, I'd feel probably a little bit differently. To be honest with you, because I think they're a better coach team. To be honest with you, I think Ohio State's oh, got better yeah. coaching than Georgia yeah. does. Yeah, I agree. And and I think Ohio State's got a more dynamic. And, and let's talk about you know, co- guy demoted his defensive coordinator during the season, Ryan Day. Right? I mean, he took play calling duties away from Kerry Coombs. Not a lot of coaches are willing to do that, and it's we're now seeing it pay off because their defense has been better. Now we'll see if it's we'll see tomorrow if it's definitely better. But it's certainly it's certainly been better recently. It's still not great by any stretch, but it's better. And that's with that offense. That's all they really need is better. <laughs> Fair enough. So you know that's 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 the big thing for me. So yeah, I know I, this. The, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Vince. I was gonna say I know this comment was made back when we were talking about my disdain for Kane Madden and and his play. Mm-hmm. I, will, I, will, I know I, will, what, I know what comment you're gonna pull up. But <laughs> just your ordinary Joe says I don't get as fired up about Kane Madden as Sean. And I think that might be a fact. Mm-hmm. Um, he 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 had something he almost lit underneath lost it during the <laughs> Thanksgiving uh, fundraiser show, man. Because <laughs> he was just sitting there all peaceful for like an hour, and then yeah. all of a sudden he's like four off his. <laughs> yes, he got fired up. It was when, awesome uh, when <laughs> Reggie said that, that and was he was awesome. he went like this, like because like Sean was because like Sean texted me, he's like, man, I was like a fan, like just listening to you and Malik and or like Reggie Malik and. Yeah, and and you guys talking, and because he was sitting like this like the whole time, and all of a sudden Reggie makes that comment. Sean was like, like it just kind of snapped him out of a trance. He's like four. <laughs> that was great. That was great. It was awesome. Uh, I I actually laughed pretty hard as I was rewatching that, or as I, yep. I can't remember if I was watching it live or I was rewatching it, but it was awesome. You were rewatching it. That you had just left a little bit before okay. that. You watched That's what it, it later. Was. Yeah. Oh, it was awesome. So yeah. great. That was good. Uh, here we go. A uh, hunter. It says, hey, guys, I was wondering if you had any advice for someone who really wants to get into sports journalism, especially for football, basketball, or baseball. Once again, much respect to you guys. Well, part of that, question. Hunter, is, yeah, it is. Part of that's going to be to, is going to be based on where you are in your life right now. What I mean by that is if you're in college or you're not in college, there's the different, the different options. But it's sort of the similar advice. Number one is find a place to write whether it's free or, or just someone that, you know, that's, that's not going to pay you much or whatever, just find a place where you can get a platform to write. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, if you're in college, write for your student paper, or like there's a a, a kid that um, covers, like does Notre Dame basketball and he's a high school kid. He's a Braze boys podcast. And I said, man, I was like, write for your, whatever school you go to write for your paper. And he's like, you know, should I stop? doing the podcast. I was like, no, don't stop doing the podcast. Like just keep learning and keep growing and keep having content. I said, because at the end of the day, for someone like me, I'm a business owner looking for writers. I did. I literally said on the application, college degree, not required. I don't care if you went to college to study journalism. I didn't. So how, why would I demand that others do? Right. I have met some people that went to college for journalism that are great writers. I've met people that went to college for journalism and they're crap writers with terrible takes right? It's about the talent, but you need to have your talent be seen mm-hmm. some way, some form or fashion. So find a place to write, whether it's starting your own blog, where you're putting out good analysis that you can then show people, whether it's what, whether it's read or not, I'm not going to care if five people read your article or 5,000 people read your article. If it's a good article and you're putting out good content, you're showing me that you can produce volume and quality work, well-researched articles where you can make an argument, where you can report the news in a a factual manner, those type of things. I want to see someone's got passion and I want to see someone that's, and again, you can, uh, being a good writer is great, but if you're an okay writer 
but your content's good, we can work on the the yeah the the the, the, the other specifics parts of it. the grammar right right we yeah. can work on that, <clears throat> but just find a place to write, right? Find a place you know go volu- go say hey look if you're not in college, and you have a job find a place that's going to work with you right I mean there's going to be people looking for stuff. I mean, I've had guys volunteer to do stuff for me. I end up paying them a little something for it, but because they do great work. Andrew McDonough, the guy who does uh, the first glance, the guy that does the series history, he does our game predictions. He's the one that did the Big Ten, Notre Dame and the Big Ten. He did the Notre Dame Navy thing. He volunteered all that. Now, you know, when I can, I give him something, but he does not, he did not ask for it, does not, did not want it. He just wanted a place to write because he has a passion for Notre Dame. Now he's got a really good job. He's not trying to get into writing. The point is there's always people say, Hey, look, if if you want to write and and you're willing to work for peanuts, because that's all I can afford, then yeah, let's give you a shot. Right. But, and then that would be my big thing. And then find a community to be a part of Hunter, a sports community that, you know, whether it's a message board, I mean, Irish breakdown would be a great thing, but a place where you can kind of engage with people and you can kind of have your opinions like where you're not writing per se, but you're engaged on a message board where you're having your opinions challenged and you're having to think and then you're having to make arguments and counter arguments. I think those kind of things where your mind gets sharpened are things that help you as well. But just and that's the biggest thing, though, is just find a place to write and understand that it, it may be for free or it may be a dollar per thousand downloads, which means you're not making anything, you know, but find a place to write because somebody will find you somebody will see you somebody will and and look that's how it started for me right i was on mike frank's message board and he asked me to do some film breakdowns i had gotten out of coaching he asked me to write a couple film breakdowns i did i did them didn't pay me much and then eventually people liked it and it became a full-time job right and well then from there that led to bgi seeing what i could do and then i got to you know get promoted so to speak to an even bigger better site and then that led me to be in a position where I can kind of now start my own business and my own website, right? But it all began because I just, I was on a message board engaging with people and I had opinions and people started asking me for my opinion. And then that led to the site owner saying, hey man, you want you want to do some work? But, and it's different for every person, but just find a place to write and and, yeah. and be passionate. That's the other thing too, is have a passion for it. You know, like, man, this this guy needs some harness. This guy needs some coaching up but man, he's got some potential. He's I'll also say, yeah, I'll also say this, depending on what community you're in Hunter, um, high school sports is poorly covered, um, across the board. Most newspapers, uh, is, is what I'm referring to. Most newspapers have pretty much gotten rid of their full-time high school sports guys. And so they ask guys to do, they're, they're like stringers. They have guys that just go out and they do games and they get paid like per story, but they're always looking for guys to write about high school sports whether it's Mm -hmm. basketball football obviously more in the fall and the winter um but contact your local paper and see if they're looking for guys to do just just game stories you know Mm -hmm. what i mean you'd be surprised because i know at least locally here and i know this is the case across the board they don't have full-time high school people you know Mm -hmm. they they get people who just they do it by story you know a story by story basis they're freelancers and they they go and they cover high school sports and you know and there it is so um i i would look into your local newspaper i think that would be a great way to kind of get your feet wet as well so hope that helped yeah hope it did you know hope it did uh tyler had a question about skip holtz because i don't know much about lou holtz's son other than him getting fired today would he ever come work at notre dame he already worked at notre dame he was the offensive coordinator at notre dame under his dad uh, I believe in the early nineties. Is that, a, mm-hmm. is that accurate, Brian? Believe so believe so. Yeah. Now. And he, you he know, was at he, least a receivers coach. I'm not sure if, I don't, rem, I don't remember if he was the offensive coordinator or not. You could be right. I, I don't, I just don't remember, but he definitely yeah, coached he, for receivers. I, let's see. I just, yeah, he was receivers 90, 91. He was the OC in 92 and 93. There you go. So yeah. And he's been assistants all over the place and he's been a head coach at his last three stops, East Carolina, South Florida, and Louisiana tech. So, um, well, I, four Yukon. Oh, I forgot about That's UConn. Where you got start was at UConn. Yep, forgot about UConn because they were one double A team at the time. That's right. You're absolutely correct. Yep, very good. So um, he's not coming back to Notre Dame anytime soon, and I don't. I think they maybe the the ship has sailed past him coming to Notre Dame. Would you agree with that? 
As far as what the head coach? Well, I mean, I don't know what in capacity Tyler was looking for him to come to Notre Dame. He's not yeah, coming mean, as an assistant. I'd, 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 I'd offer him a good chunk of money to come back as an analyst. I think Lou. There I think Skip go. Holtz is a smart football mind. I do I just, too. I do too. I just don't know if he's a dynamic coach or not yet. But I would love to have a guy like you know, kind of on the Nick Saban, uh, the Nick Saban sort of coaching. Uh, I wish Notre Dame would turn into that, right? Sure. The the, the whole uh, <laughs> Nick Saban like a- coach rehabilitation program, you know, start your own <laughs> Notre Dame coaching really rehabilitation program. No doubt. That's actually pretty funny because yeah. it's true. Um, <laughs> that's funny. That's good. That's yeah. good stuff. Because you, know, you can they hire start as anybody analysts. you want to be an analyst right. and you can have as many as you want. I mean, right. I don't believe there's any limit. It's just however much you can spend or, or what you're willing to spend. So that's some, some really good questions today, everybody. Yeah, no doubt about really, it. Really, really good questions today. So uh, I, th- I think we kind of, I think we kind of worked through them all events. Yeah. I, here's one I'll throw out at you. Drew says, who's a team Notre Dame hasn't played or uh, hasn't played in a while that you'd like to see. I think you kind of, we. I feel like we had this conversation not that long ago because mm-hmm. um, we were talking about how Notre Dame should schedule and, you know, things of that nature. And I, and I, I believe we had this conversation, but I'll, I'll throw it to you anyway. Uh, teams that you want Notre Dame to play. I, I would like to see them play Tennessee again. I, I would sure. like to see a somewhat regular thing with Tennessee, you know, where every decade you're playing two to four games with them in a decade. UCLA is one. I like. I would rather play UCLA than than Stanford, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of some others. I mean, those those are kind of the main ones. There's no. There's not. A, I mean, of teams that I wouldn't mind seeing back on the the schedule, I wouldn't mind seeing Purdue or Michigan State, one or the other, back on the schedule on a more regular basis. Those are rivalries I liked. I'd rather play them than Michigan. I have zero desire to have Michigan back on the schedule. Uh, but, yeah, I think te- UCLA and Tennessee are the first two that come to mind as far as teams they haven't played that you'd like to see them play. I also wouldn't mind seeing Colorado at uh, home and home with Colorado once every decade, hmm. like a two-year thing every decade. Because, I mean, you know, again, think about the era I grew up in. Yeah, Notre Dame, well, yeah. Colorado had some, a couple great games back then. You know, right. but there's there's just not a lot. That's more sentimental than the actual practical because yeah. there's yeah, you know, there's just not a lot of recruits coming out of the Colorado that would really impact you. Uh, and since they're not in the Big Ten, any, Big Twelve anymore, it doesn't really help you get into that Texas Southwest part of the country thing. So, but yeah, that, those those would be some. Here's a good one, uh, Vince. Mark Applegate says, "Love the show, diehard Notre Dame fan. Thank you for being with us, Mark. Why does the, that thirteenth data point matter so much to everyone?" When you don't play anyone impressive, SEC fans and ESPN especially, it's an ESPN thing. It doesn't yeah. matter to everyone. It only matters to ESPN. Yep, and that's I mean, what people that, listen that, to, right? And and they're the primary voice. I, it's because honestly, I I mean, again, I could be I could be showing my own bias here, but what I believe is it's because it's the one thing you can consistently use against Notre Dame. Correct. That's what I think it's about. Correct. Because but it doesn't know, apply to anyone yeah. other than Notre Dame. That's exactly right. They that never they didn't complain never... in 2017 about how Bama didn't have a second data point. I don't remember hearing them complain in 2016 that Ohio State didn't have a, a 13th data point. It only applies to Notre Dame. They only ever use it when it's Notre Dame. And, and it's such an easy to dismantle and dismiss thing. I mean, I can exactly. do it with one sarcastic tweet, you know, and, and but it, it's just <laughs> because it's just because they're lazy on And that's what happens when you have no competition. That's the reality. You you can do kind of do whatever you want because you know people aren't going to turn us off because they have no other options. Right. Well, that's why I'm so glad that the big noon kickoff started because I have not watched one second of college game day all year. Now I'm yeah. going to have to go back and find the video of the most recent one because I'm writing an article next week about the absurd freaking comments that Desmond Howard make and oh. that some Notre Dame fans are jumping onto. Like they want to hammer Desmond. I'm like, you're saying the same thing. Yeah, so I don't exactly. know why you're mad at Desmond because you're saying the same thing. Brian Kelly's taking us as far as we can go. Remember what it was like before Brian Kelly? That's the same exact stupid thing that Desmond Howard said this week. Right. So right. I, I'm going to have to watch that. But I haven't watched a second of game day the rest of the year. Because, number one, the only reason I watched it last year at all, and it wasn't often, is gone. That's Tom Rinaldi. Right? Yeah. He's gone. And now he's on Fox. And, and the Big 12 has improved – the Big Noon kickoff has improved their product every single year. It's gotten way better. 
And I thought I was concerned about Bob Stoops replacing Urban Meyer because I actually liked watching Urban do it last year because he was he would get like into the weeds and I, he would nerd out and I loved it when he would nerd out like get X's and O's and draw stuff up. Bob Stoops does a really good job on that. So I, uh, I, I mean, I just it's just an ESPN thing. But you can be lazy when you have no competition, exactly because there's no one to call you out on it. It just and, feels and like they go through the to. motions anymore. Yeah, it does. To and it's, they just regurgitate the same crap every year. They just right. apply it to different teams. Right. But the 13th data point, like, you know, Dan, Dan and Danny Cano, I don't think, does he work for ESPN? I don't think he works for ESPN. But he's the one that tweeted out that stupid comment the other day about Notre Dame schedule BYU. No, why? You think anyone's going to respect Notre Dame because they beat BYU? You, you know, like we would because they're a top 15 team, but – as I said earlier, immediately no, upon Notre Dame beating them, well, they're not even a Power Five team, and you know it doesn't really matter, and blah 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 blah. And, you know, Bama was playing Georgia, and Ohio State was playing whoever. It wouldn't matter anymore. Uh, it just they would yeah. find something else because it's really not. And this is the point, Mark. And this is a great question. It wouldn't even. Ma- could, it's not about the thirteenth data point. It's about them. Yeah. They want ESP. They want Notre Dame. And this is my feeling. It's my opinion. They want Notre Dame to feel like an outsider, that the only chance we have is to join a conference. Right. Or to sign with ESPN. Yep. Because that's good for them for money. And joining and the conference would put them with ESPN. Just right. like that. Because, Unless, right. Because yeah. they know they joined the ACC. Yeah. They know that Notre Dame is contractually obligated to join the ACC. And I think it also makes a lot of sense for them because the ACC becomes incredibly more valuable when Notre Dame plays, why, why else do you think Notre Dame played a Virginia, a six and three Virginia team who didn't have a starting quarterback in a prime time game on ESPN? They know they get it. Why is Fox putting right. a three and eight Stanford team exactly. against Notre Dame on at eight o'clock? Exactly. It's because they know that Notre Dame, when Notre Dame's good, Notre Dame makes a lot of money because yeah. everybody watches that game because you're either watching because you're a Notre Dame fan or you're watching because you hate Notre Dame and you want to see him lose. There are very few teams that create that kind of dramatic difference. They know that the minute that that Notre Dame joins the ACC, that that immediately boosts the value of that conference, which right now, football-wise, is struggling, especially with Florida State and now Clemson being down. Right. Nobody uh, cares absolutely. about the ACC right now. I mean, absolutely. why are we not talking more about Pitt? Pitt's a 9-2 and two football team, about to be 10-2. and two. They're a good football team, you know? But, you know, we don't hear about that because – they're in the ACC, and they're not Clemson. They're not Florida State. They're not Miami. Yep. Simple as that. Got two more I'm going to finish with um, before we head on out. Sounds good. I want to watch the Cincinnati game. And my Think- buzzer just went off. I got to go check the turkey. So <laughs> yeah, There you go. Thinker says, can you explain why you have no desire to see Michigan on the schedule mm-hmm. again? Just curious. Yeah. I loathe Michigan. Love destroying them. Yeah. When presented with the opportunity, thanks. Very good question. Good I just have – I just don't think much of that rivalry. I don't – I don't think it adds a whole lot to Notre Dame. I, I despise Michigan. I despise the role they played in keeping Notre Dame out of the Big Ten in the first place. That's a good point. Uh, right twice. There. Uh, I despise their their view of themselves, the thought that they're so much more important than they actually are. Uh, I just dis- dislike everything about their football program. I, I just – I do. And I don't think that Notre Dame now gets as much out of beating them as they did 30 years ago. Yeah. 30 years ago, when you beat Michigan, it mattered because you were going to be a, you you know, it was going to be a big win at the end of the year. It just doesn't matter now. I think Notre Dame being in the ACC and Notre Dame playing even a more national schedule now, because Notre Dame's always played a national schedule. It's more so now than it's ever been because they always had like four or five locked in, like Big Ten ish type of games, which is not national. That's regional. You you always have Michigan, you always have Michigan State, you always had Purdue, you know, then they'd schedule Indiana, they'd schedule Northwestern, you know, Penn State. It was always kind of, you know, then BC and Pitt. And there was always right. sort of like that Midwest and Northeast, like half your schedule was that. Right. That's not the case anymore. And so I just don't know what value Michigan brings. Sure. Now, if Michigan's got good again, maybe. But then again, you're, you're already playing USC. You're already playing, you know, Clemson and Miami and ACC teams. You're scheduling Ohio State. You're scheduling Texas A&M. You're scheduling Alabama. You're scheduling Florida. What does playing Michigan bring you that those teams don't? Notre Dame doesn't need to tap into Michigan to play Michigan to tap into the state of Michigan for recruits. I, I just 
too close already. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I don't think that matters. So I just don't know what playing Michigan brings them. And, and the fact that I then also despise everything that they stand for as a fan base, as an institution, the fact that their president last year was trying to sabotage the season because he didn't want to play. This was another reason why I just, just despise everything about him. And, and I've always respected the players. I, I've always respected the product that they put on the field back in the day under Bo. I despise Michigan, but you know, you knew you were, they were going to be a well coached, hard nosed, blue collar team. And I always like that about them. But it's the other stuff that I just, I just despise. And I just don't see the value in that. And, and Purdue and Michigan State have been far more loyal rivals than Michigan. And they just have. There's a lot more at stake for Notre Dame. There's there's a lot more to gain for Michigan playing Notre Dame than there is for Mi- Notre Dame playing Michigan. Yep, I agree. And, and I just, yeah. yeah. Jim Ryan has our final Super Chat of the day. Jim, thank you for the Super Chat. He says, we should play Michigan State and Purdue yearly. Notre Dame should want its students to go to a road game uh, so when they graduate, they know how to travel for one. I don't know about that last part. <laughs> yeah, I... Um... Oh, I okay. I get it. Yeah. So, because you want more of a Notre Dame feel at away games, you know, outside of Purdue and and uh, in Michigan State, I, Notre Dame never really has a problem packing the stands that they're when road they're games. on the road. Well, he's know. talking about for students. Oh, because okay. like Michigan State and Purdue, students can drive. And right, they do. but it says after they graduate, so they know how to travel well, I, to one. Yeah, but I, I, I think know. what he's saying now though is, but a lot of the students traveling to games now are the ones that grew up like we talked about in the era where they were playing Michigan, Michigan State, and Purdue, and Penn gotcha. State all the time, right? So the students now aren't necessarily – there's not a whole lot of them that have graduated in, in this re- more recent era since they stopped playing those teams because that's only within the last, I mean, four or five years that they really stopped playing those teams. Sure. Uh, I agree. I don't know if they need to play both of them every year. I don't – I I don't – One of the others fine by me. Yeah. I, it, look, if you wanted to replace Stanford with Purdue and, and, and or Michigan State in some sort of rotation, two, 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 and two, I'd be fine with that. Yeah. I'd be totally fine with that. I would use it differently, but I'd, I'd – I mean, there's another spot that I would – I would have no problem playing Michigan State and Purdue on a relatively regular basis. I don't think you need to play either one of them every year, and if you were going to play one of them every year, I'd pick Purdue because they're the in-state school. I also have sort of a respect for Michigan State because – Back when Michigan was trying to keep them out, it was the people at Michigan State that actually fought for Notre Dame to be in. They were one of those few schools that actually had Notre Dame's back at times. But, you know, Purdue, the, I like the in-state aspect of it uh, with Purdue. That's the reason I would have. Plus, there's been some great – I think Purdue is one of the three or four teams that Notre Dame has played more than the most. Yeah. I mean, they've played a ton. Yeah. That's a rivalry. If I was going to say you have to have one more, if you replace Stanford, you have to replace them with one team that you're going to play every year. I say, oh, easy, Purdue. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Okay. Well, I think that is going to do it for this edition of the Irish Breakdown podcast, our Friday free for all mailbag. We, uh, it was a little extended because no school today. Woo. I want to do something real quick, Vince. Michael Rudiger, we're going to talk about this next week. So did you see Joel Klatt talking oh, about how yeah. Brian Kelly told him this isn't our year, this is rebuild when he talked to him? Yeah, we're we're gonna have a show about that next week. We're we're gonna have plenty to say about that last week for next week for sure. So uh so yeah, we'll come out and we'll yeah. we'll probably talk about on Sunday night when we do our upon further review show, we will give mm-hmm. you guys the update of what our week is going mm-hmm. to look like at that yep. point. So you guys know what to expect, but we're mm-hmm. gonna mix it up. We're going to mix it up a little bit for sure. Yep. It's going to be a fun week. And I tend to like those shows even more, especially the way that Notre Dame's schedule has been so soft the last month. It's like, I don't even want to talk about it. It's been tough. It's been tough. I mean, really, honestly, since the, since the North Carolina game, we haven't gone into a week where, especially since, well, Virginia was pretty good on one side of the ball, but then there was a question mark if their quarterback would actually play, but their defense was awful. Right. That was not a fun show to prepare for, but, um, but yeah. then the last two have been rough. I mean, yep. Georgia Tech and Stanford have been rough. So yeah, because they, they stink on both sides of the ball. Yes, <laughs> that's that correct. That's that's the deal on that one. So, that but anyway, yeah, Vince. But yeah, thanks for being on the show with me today, Vince. I yeah. do appreciate it. Like button, subscribe button, notification bell. Give us a five star review, and be ready to join me. I'm not sure who I'm going to be with tomorrow after the show. After the game, we will be on, and then we're also going to next week talk. We're going to we're going to bring up an idea that we're going to have for next Saturday for a show next Saturday. 
that we would be very curious to have your opinions on. So yes. yeah, I, uh, I appreciate every, everybody being part of it. So for Vince over there, I'm Brian. Hey. Everybody have a great, great rest of your day. Go have some leftovers. I'm going to go have my first. My leftovers are going to be tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, thank great. you for being with us. We'll talk to you again very, very soon.